a popular and fun-loving college student. Mindy was a very bubbly person. She just always seemed to be happy. She had a light in her eyes, and she accepted everyone. Is found savagely murdered in her apartment. There was a belt wrapped around her neck and appeared to be a broken off knife still stuck in her throat. Police need to determine, was this a sinister obsession? Mindy, I know what happened to you. God picked the beautiful flower. He had called and left numerous messages on her cell phone. Just really a strange type of relationship. A crucial piece of evidence. There was some material under the fingernails of her left hand. I know you got a mark on your hand. How did you get this? Shines a light on a dangerous predator no one saw coming. I was very shocked. I think everybody was. He was not the man we thought he was. I don't think I would ever expect that outcome at all. Oh, hey, Mindy, it's Danny. Anyway, you can just give me a call back. Okay, bye. Hey, Mindy, trying to get over Where are you? I remember trying to call Mindy a few times and she wasn't answering. So me and my friend Danielle drove and parked in front of her apartment across the street. I ran inside and knocked on um, the door and there was no answer. And it wasn't locked. And so I opened the door and I stepped in. And about two steps in, I saw something on the ground right in front of my feet. It was Mindy. And then I noticed something around her neck. Horrified, Mindy's friend rushes outside to call 911. About 10 minutes before 9 o'clock at night, dispatch called me at my house and said that they've got a hysterical caller on the phone. I got the address and it was one block from my house. When I arrived, both Danielle and Tony were very distraught, very upset. The apartment was located on the second floor of the building. As I entered, I could uh, smell a very strong odor like an ammonia disinfectant. The uh, body of the victim was laying across the entry hallway. And it appeared her throat had been half cut open. Detectives begin their investigation and identify the victim as 22-year-old college senior, Mindy Morgenster. I knew Mindy. She was a student at the uh, college. I had seen her at a lot of their events. And to see that it was her, I was really surprised and quite shocked. There was a belt wrapped around her neck and appeared to be a broken off knife still stuck in her throat. It appeared that the belt was applied to the neck prior to the neck being cut. Investigators find an empty bottle of disinfectant beside the body. Somebody had poured the disinfectant over her body, possibly trying to destroy any type of evidence. The killer tried to cover their tracks, but investigators find something they missed. There was some material under the fingernails of her left hand where possibly Mindy had scratched her assailant. We felt that this was going to be a DNA forensic type case based on materials that were found on Mindy's fingernails. And uh, to preserve that, the hands are placed in bags for autopsy. She had a purse around her right arm. Her wallet was laying just outside of the purse. It didn't appear that they'd been gone through or anything removed from them. There was clean laundry around the body and a laundry basket. It almost appeared as if she was attacked as she was going in the door with that laundry. 
it did not look like uh, the apartment had been ransacked or, or gone through. So it, it didn't appear that theft was a motive in this killing. There was no sign of any forced entry into the apartment. It told us that the person was either in her apartment or followed her in. Her cell phone was located, and the first missed call on that phone was at 12.47 p.m. on September 13th. That gave us some indication as to what time the attack may have occurred. By 10 p.m., more than nine hours after the first missed call, detectives have little to go on as they work into the night at the crime scene. When we uh, first left the scene the uh, following morning, we had no clear indication of who may have done this. Police reach Mindy's sister to inform her of the murder, and she delivers the tragic news to her parents. The front doorbell rang, and I said, who's there? And Rebecca, our daughter, she said, it's me, Dad. We've got some bad news. And then Rebecca said to me that, Mom, Mindy is dead. It was just like somebody taking a knife and just sticking it right into your heart. I just wanted to try to just say, no, this isn't real, this didn't happen. I didn't want it to be true. She had such a loving, loving heart, and I loved her very much. Born in Bogota, Colombia, on April 29, 1984, Mindy was adopted as a baby by Valley City Farmers Larry and Eunice Morgenstern. The first time I saw Mindy, she had the biggest, darkest, most beautiful eyes that I had ever seen. She, it was pretty, pretty, pretty amazing to see this little, little character in the basket that she brought home to be part of our family. Mindy was the youngest of four Morgenstern children, three of them adopted by Larry and Eunice. Mindy was very much a tomboy, and as she grew up, she got so beautiful, she didn't really realize that she would be looked upon as somebody that would turn boys' heads. After high school, Mindy moved to Valley City and dove headlong into college life. She just seemed to enjoy all the friends that she had there. Mindy was a very friendly, outgoing, bubbly person. She just always seemed to be happy. She had a light in her eyes, and she accepted everyone. Mindy's future was looking bright until the stunning attack that cut her down in her prime. It was very difficult to see Mindy's body in the condition that it was in when we found her. I want to find out who did this because she was loved by a lot of people in our community. Back at the crime scene, Mindy's two friends tell detectives they weren't the only ones to see Mindy's body. When Tony found Mindy at the scene, she screamed. Uh, which alerted a uh, man in a neighboring apartment to come out to, to see what was wrong. He was there when I first entered the apartment complex, and they showed me where Mindy was located. He told investigators that he checked for a pulse using the, the back of his hand to not leave any fingerprints on the victim. It was a little odd because... People don't describe things like that, like using the back of their hand so they don't leave fingerprints and things like that. If he was there to help, I couldn't understand why he'd be worried about something like that. Police identify the man as Robert Linz and soon notice a telling detail about him. He had scratches on his hands that would correspond to someone trying to get your hands off of them when they were being attacked. Had Mindy scratched Robert as she fought for her life? Robert Linz having those scratches, being in the same building, he certainly needed to be looked at. A lot of times a person at the crime scene is a person that committed the crime. 
and if any evidence of them is found, they have an excuse for saying why it was there. Coming up, detectives uncover a world of secrets. She reminded me so much of my wife in her younger days. Like, I don't want you talking to her. It's kind of weird. It turned out upon checking his background that he had a felony record. And as they zero in on a killer... I was absolutely certain we had the right guy. A stunning setback turns the case on its head. I just thought, oh, it's all over with now. They're going to let him go. This case was a shock to everybody. When we found out who the person was, it was just, wow. investigating the murder of 22-year-old college student Mindy Morgenstern have just identified their first suspect, her neighbor, Robert Linz. When officers met Robert Linz, they noticed some scratches on his hands. And he also used the back of his hand to see if she was deceased or not. His concern was he didn't want to leave any fingerprints or DNA in the apartment because he had nothing to do with the incident. Suspicions aroused. Police bring Robert Linz into the station for an interview. Could you before? I knew her in passing. We'd see her every day. All he knew about her is that she was a pretty girl and that she lived in the apartment building. When investigators dig into Robert's history, they find something troubling. It turned out upon... Uh, checking his background, that he had a felony record. Oh, I got apologize. He was a strong car. And, uh, you know, my original sentence was um, two years in England. Robert Lenz was in the criminal system out in California. He's street smart, and he knew not to leave fingerprints at a crime scene. Detectives ask Robert how he got the scratches on his hands. All your hands are really cut up and stuff. Is that normal from work? Yeah, this is an everyday thing. Having like steel and stuff. On. Yeah, all day long steel. I get cut pretty bad constantly. He claimed he worked at a, a place where they built steel buildings and stuff like that, and he got the bruises on his hands from his job. Police cut to the chase and ask Robert where he was on the day Mindy was murdered. Uh, wasn't there anything out of the ordinary, regular day work? But then oh, you start. I start. I'm there like five minutes to seven. Robert Linz told investigators that he had been at, at work that day from seven in the morning, and he didn't arrive uh, home to his apartment until about five thirty. We talked to his employer. He did work all day. He did work with steel, so it's very easy for him to cut his hands. So there was really nothing to put him at that apartment at the time the crime occurred. Still, police aren't ready to rule out Robert just yet. We asked him to provide DNA sample, which he agreed to. While they await DNA test results, police canvass Mindy's neighbors. We were looking for anybody that might have seen something, heard something, so we can get a better timeline as far as when this might have happened. While going door to door, investigators are pleased to see a familiar face. As I was collecting statements outside, I saw Mo Gibbs. He had been living in the apartment building with his wife and stepdaughter. Mo works at the Barnes County Jail, and due to the fact that he was a correctional officer, I would run into him quite often while he was working. And I also knew Mo because we played on the co-ed softball tournament together. A guy in his position probably would be an excellent witness if he had seen or heard anything. Mo Gibbs said that he knew Mindy as a person that lived in the building. He had seen her come and go. The investigator asked Mo if he noticed anything unusual that afternoon. Mo had said that he went with his wife and stepdaughter for lunch, then came back to the apartment at about uh, 12.45 and uh, started packing and loading uh, boxes as he and his wife were going to be moving out of the apartment. 
He mentioned that when he went into the apartment complex, he could smell a strong, distinct odor of a disinfectant. Other than that, he claimed that he didn't hear or see anything. So we were working with the timeline between the first missed call at 12.47 p.m. and the disinfectant being smelled shortly after 1 o'clock p.m. So we figured she probably was deceased prior to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. To rule them out, police collect DNA samples from Mo and the other building residents. All the DNA samples taken during our interviews were sent to the state crime lab. In search of new leads, detectives turned to Mindy's loved ones. I just didn't think there was anybody that would want to do anything like that to her. Investigators push Mindy's parents to think hard about anyone who might have had a problem with her. Mindy's mother mentioned that Tony had had this boyfriend that wasn't uh, such a nice person. His name was James. I was dating James Robinson at the time, and he was doing some bad things, and I was taking the brunt of it, and Mindy didn't really care for him because she had known that there was times that it got pretty scary. Mindy did bring him up at one time, something about him being on drugs or something. Mindy was trying to get Tony to quit seeing James, and that may give him some reason to hold a grudge against Mindy. This James Robinson didn't look like he wanted his girlfriend, Tony, to be friends with Mindy. She did, you know, obviously like a friend does, get out. You know, you need to leave. He's not a good guy. This isn't a good relationship. In trying to help her friend, had Mindy made a deadly enemy? Seemed like an attack was personal in nature. It made me think that maybe this guy had something to do with her death. Investigators are hunting for the killer of popular college student Mindy Morgenstern. They now suspect James Robinson, who may have held a grudge against Mindy for trying to turn his girlfriend, Tony, against him. So James was called in to do an interview to see what we could glean from him. Did you know Mindy pretty well? I knew her from going to visit Tony at work and she'd be there or whatever. And we'd get together every once in a while, go out to the theater. Police ask James if he has a criminal record. James said that uh, he had, in the past, had trouble with illegal drugs. He had been charged, but uh, he was trying to stay out of uh, that lifestyle. As James talks, detectives notice suspicious cuts on his hands. Shoot your hand. Yeah, it went right through a window. Blood like something here. It looks pretty fresh. Police pressed James on his whereabouts at the time of the murder. What were you doing during the day? I know I had four hours of community service stuff to do. James told investigators that he went to do community service from these previous charges. He then went to a friend's house and uh, went back home sometime five o'clock or later. We checked and it was verified that uh, he had been at those locations that day. Even though James's alibi checks out, investigators collect a DNA sample in order to officially rule him out. As they review evidence from the crime scene, autopsy results arrive. The autopsy of Mindy's body indicated that she had died from asphyxiation and due to the cuts to her neck. There was no indication that Mindy had been sexually assaulted. Still awaiting results on DNA collected from Mindy's fingernails, detectives turned to her co-workers for new leads. Mindy had been working at a restaurant in Valley City as a waitstaff. It was important to interview Mindy's co-workers and see if they knew of anyone unusual in the restaurant. 
that uh, stood out to them. There was a man that lived in a motor home across the street from the restaurant. Mindy told co-workers that he made her feel really uneasy, and he was always in there bothering them. So hearing that information, we decided to interview him. What's your full name? Ralph Albert Walter. So how long have you been in Valley City? Well, I don't know. You could say I'm a drifter, but... Uh... Mr. Walters didn't have any ties to the area. Just kind of an odd character. You remember anything particular he did on Wednesday? Oh, that was the day that could change the oil in the motor home. He really didn't have a, a good alibi for when Mindy was murdered. Just as with previous suspects, detectives spot a potentially damning clue. I thought you got a mark on your hand. How did you get that? When I put that oil filter on. Have you had any type of altercation or disagreement in any of the restaurants with anybody? I can't think of any. He claimed he never bothered anybody in the restaurant where Mindy worked. Claimed he didn't know who she was. But Mindy's co-workers tell a different story. They all said that he was in there quite often. Mr. Walters would have seen her coming and going, at least. Would that give him a reason to follow her? We really didn't know uh, at that point. Red flags were waving, of course, but I was real careful not to jump to any conclusions too early on in the investigation. Detectives collect Ralph's DNA and let him go but they're not ready to clear him just yet. We keep him on the list. We're hoping DNA samples, if he was involved, would eventually tie him into it. Two days after the murder, the wait for answers starts to take a toll on Mindy's family. That was the hard part, not knowing what was going on and what happened and why. It was like living someplace in another world and you just wanted answers. Three days into the investigation, detectives catch a break when they find disturbing voicemails left on Mindy's phone after she was dead. You know my number, sweetie. I miss you. I love you. You're my inspiration. Please help me. Please help me. Mindy? I can't continue without you. Detectives search the number and discover that it belongs to a man named Rodney Kuznia. After Mindy had passed away, he had called and left numerous messages on her cell phone. Investigators rush to find out who Rodney Kuznia is and why he called Mindy after her murder. Mindy's friends had told us about a previous boyfriend by the name of Kyle Kuznia. They had been very serious and they had broken up the prior year. Mindy's phone indicated a lot of calls between she and Kyle's father, Rodney. We thought this was really odd because why would an ex-boyfriend's father be so interested in Mindy? There was some indication from Mindy's friends that Mindy had told Rodney to quit calling her. It's been three days since 22-year-old Mindy Morgenstern was found brutally murdered in her apartment. Police have a new suspect, an ex-boyfriend's father who left suspicious voicemails for Mindy after her death. Mindy, this is Rod. I know what happened to you. Please look here, your boy. Can't take this. I love you, kid. God picked a beautiful flower. I'm sorry it didn't happen that way. It happened to you. It just was really odd why Mindy's ex-boyfriend's father 
was leaving these messages, why he was so infatuated with her, and, and obviously he had feelings for her. Eager to learn more about Mindy's communication with Rodney, detectives start by questioning his son, Kyle. Kyle was Mindy's ex-boyfriend. And Mindy, I think, still had feelings for Kyle. It was found that Kyle had broken off his relationship with her a year before and was planning to get married to someone else and had really had very little contact with Mindy since that time that they had broken up. I feel a little bad that maybe I could have handled it a little differently. Have you had any other contact with her? No, that was the last time I ever talked to her. I know she would kind of leave information kind of through my dad. Him and her would continue to talk. After verifying that Kyle was working out of town on the day of the murder, detectives turned their questions to his father's relationship with Mindy. I said, it's like, I don't want you talking to her. You know, 10, 20 years down the road, you guys are still going to be talking. And it's kind of weird. It is kind of weird. Yeah. It was actually ruining his relationship with his father because Rodney was so involved with Mindy still. I even asked my dad, but I would appreciate it if you guys would stop talking. Rod Kuznia had an almost unhealthy amount of contact with Mindy, and then that continued even after Kyle and Mindy broke up. The calls were very frequent, like multiple times daily. And it really made us wonder, did Mindy want him to quit calling her? Did that make him angry? Detectives bring Rodney Kuznia in for an interview. He was at least in his 50s, and we weren't sure what it was that he wanted out of Mindy. You and Mindy became, as you call it, friend. She dated your son. Correct. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the relationship. Well, you definitely did. She was quite the boat leap character. She reminded me so much of my wife in her younger days. Detectives press Rodney about the messages he left after hearing of Mindy's death. I did call after I heard the fact that he left the message. I don't know if it's really stupid to do that, but they wanted her to pick up and have What did you tell her? Oh God, take the power. It was just really a, a strange type of relationship between a man that was her boyfriend's father and her. Detectives press Rodney on his whereabouts at the time of the murder. Rod Gutznia indicated that he was working on his farm with his two sons from seven in the morning till early in the evening. We checked and verified that yes, he had been at work that day. Detectives collect DNA from Rodney, but with nothing concrete against him, they must let him go. We still thought that it was such an odd relationship that we certainly wouldn't close the book on, on looking at, at Rodney any further. The pressure to find Mindy's killer only increases as the community becomes gripped by fear. It was super scary because you didn't know who it was. It could have been anybody. You were scared to go out by yourself. You were scared to do anything. It wasn't safe Little Valley City anymore. Six days after the murder, Mindy's funeral draws hundreds of mourners. We had the funeral at the high school gym because we didn't think that everybody could fit into the church while there was over 500 people at the funeral. The police told us they would have some undercover agents watching because they didn't know for sure if this person was, you know, after her or after us. And you get kind of paranoid of anything like that happening until they finally catch the right person. The day after Mindy's funeral, investigators receive surprising news from the crime lab. The state crime lab called and said that we have a positive match of the DNA. The DNA extracted from under the fingernails of Mindy matched an unsolved brutal sexual assault in Fargo two years previously. And when we found out who the person was, 
it was just kind of silence. Then it was uh, a shock. One week after the murder of 22-year-old Mindy Morgenstern, detectives received DNA test results that turned the case on its head. The DNA from every one of the suspects, Kozhnia, Walters, Lind, and the others, all came back as not a match to the DNA found under Mindy's fingernails. I asked, who is it? They told me it was Mo Gibbs. When they got the match, it was just, wow. The uh, DNA match of Mo Gibbs is really unexpected for us. I knew him personally. He was a correctional officer, and it really caught me off guard that somebody in the law enforcement community would have done something like this. When detectives look deep into Mo's background, they discover a hidden past. Mo Gibbs was not the man we thought he was. When we started digging into his background, we had found out that he'd actually changed his name. We found out that he was involved in a drive-by shooting and he had served five years in prison. Also, his DNA matched this reported rape in Fargo from two years previously. Given Mo's violent criminal past, Detectives come up with a strategy to lure him into the station. We had called Mo and asked him if he would be willing to come in just to eliminate him as a suspect. We're playing on his friendship with law enforcement. The idea was to get him in, lock him into a story, and then immediately give him the polygraph. Mo Gibbs lived in the apartment building that Mindy lived in, and he said that he had seen her around but he really didn't know her at all. Mo said that he had worked at the jail the previous night, uh, had gotten home about seven in the morning, and then he started packing and loading boxes out of uh, the apartment. Anything unusual that you noticed in the apartment building? No. I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary the whole day. You know, I was back and forth. Scratches were observed on Mo's hands. And Mo stated that he got those scratches from moving boxes. The polygraph operator asked him if he'd ever been in Mindy's room or in her apartment. I went to her place one time, and that was probably either a week and a half or two weeks ago. He stated that she was trying to carry a laundry basket and, and some other things all at the same time. And he assisted her in carrying that laundry to her apartment. I'm thinking that he wanted to have an excuse for having evidence in that apartment. With Mo's story in place, the polygraph can begin. Regarding Mindy's death, do you intend to truthfully answer those questions? Yes. Did you injure Mindy and cause her death? No. At the conclusion of the polygraph examination, the examiner felt that there was some indication of deception. There's a little bit of indication there that something is bothering you about this. And, um, you know, I, I guess I just want to try and get it resolved. I mean, I don't know nothing about it. I mean, as far as anything else, I wasn't there. So it's not bothering me that I know. I mean, because uh -huh. I know I wasn't there. Okay. What do you know about DNA? Nothing. Nothing? How would you feel if I told you that your DNA matches DNA that we found on Mindy's body? <laughs> I'd be like, that wasn't true, so I know I wasn't there, so. At that point, we didn't think that he was really going to ever admit to anything, at least that day. We're in a bind here. Your DNA is matching what we found on her, under her fingernails. I don't know how my fingernail, my DNA was under, under her fingernails. When we get DNA back, though, and it says, this is the person that it matches, this person out of so many million, we can't argue with that whole. Plus, I'm going to let you in on something else here. The DNA that they match, that they brought up, it also matches 
uh, the DNA that was found on a girl that was sexually assaulted two years ago in Fargo. Okay. <laughs> he was arrested immediately after that interview and charged with murder. Could you stand up, please, and put your hand your back? We have an arrest warrant for the murder of Mindy Morgan. News of Moe's arrest opens a floodgate of shocking accusations. A number of female inmates in the jail where Mo Gibbs worked came forward and said, he's been doing sexual stuff to us in the jail for weeks or months. Mo is charged with six felonies for the sexual assaults and one count of first-degree murder. It was a very, very much a shock when they revealed who was arrested. I was very surprised and very shocked due to the fact I knew him personally, but it was a great feeling to get the person who had done this horrific crime. We went to trial in Minot, North Dakota, provided evidence to the jury there about the DNA under her fingernails the scratches on his hand. Despite the evidence against him, Moe's lawyers mount a strong defense. Their argument was the DNA found in Mindy's fingernails was probably touch DNA that she got from doorknobs that Mo Gibbs had been touching. I went into the jury deliberations believing strongly that we'd proved our case beyond a reasonable doubt. On July 12, 2007, the jury returns to the courtroom with news that takes everyone by surprise. The jury deliberated for a fair period of time and came back as a hung jury and could not reach a decision. We were so sure he was going to go down, but they just got him off. You kind of went home and you were thinking, what are we going to do now? Corrections officer Mo Gibbs has just been tried for the murder of 22-year-old Mindy Morgenstern. But when the verdict comes back, a hung jury, Mindy's loved ones are left fearing the worst. I was very shocked. I think everybody was. I don't think I would ever expect that outcome at all. When we heard it was a hung jury, I just thought, oh, it's all over with now. They're going to let him go. Was it possible that Mo had not killed Mindy after all? Or was a murderer about to go free? When a hung jury like that happens, it's extremely disappointing and hard to understand for people because it's just a temporary setback. I was absolutely certain we had the right guy. In the Minot trial, the defense, the one thing they really hung their hat on was that trying to say it was just touch DNA. We felt it was obvious that to get DNA under your fingernails, it wasn't from touching any kind of doorknob. So we wanted to totally rule that out and were able to find another expert to help us do that. On October 22, 2007, more than a year after Mindy's murder, Mo Gibbs goes on trial for the second time. The expert described this as a vigorous assault. The amount of DNA was not from touching a doorknob or a laundry basket. The prosecution lays out further evidence, carefully building the case against Mo. Mo Gibbs' phone was seized after his arrest. There were never times when he went for an hour or more that he was not texting or doing something with his phone. He got off at 7 in the morning from his shift, and he was continually either emailing or texting people until he had to go pick up his fiance to go to lunch. He dropped her back off around 12.30 or 1 o'clock, and that's when we believe he came back to the apartment building Mindy's last missed call was at 12.47 that day, and 
for the next two hours, Mo Gibbs was doing something else other than sending texts or sending emails. With DNA and other evidence placing Mo at the scene, the prosecution lays out their theory of the murder. I believe that Mindy was carrying clothes into her apartment and Mo Gibbs was in the hallway and got her in there and pushed her on the floor and attempted to rape her. I think Mindy fought back and things went drastically wrong. I think what happened was he tried strangling her with a belt. It wasn't going as he wanted it to. She wasn't dying fast enough. So he got a knife and he stabbed her. And then when he got done, he finds a a cleaning solution, dumps it on her body. And then he gets the heck out of there. Then he starts back with the texting and emailing and went on with his life. As Moe's second murder trial concludes, prosecutors have one final card to play. There was a cellmate of Mo Gibbs while he was awaiting trial that had told investigators that Mo had admitted to uh, killing Mindy. Gibbs had told them that he'd done it, he'd do it again if he had the opportunity. As the jury deliberates for a second time, Mindy's loved ones nervously await the outcome. And I was wondering, what's going on? I wanted to know things. I wanted to hear what was coming out of their mouths. On November 16, 2007, after deliberating for over 27 hours, the jury returns with the verdict. We, the jury, do find the defendant Mo M. Gibbs guilty of the crime of murder. For killing Mindy Morgenstern, Mo Gibbs is sentenced to life without parole. He got a 12 year sentence on the unsolved rape and 15 years on the jail sexual assaults that had happened. It was a relief that they finally caught the person that he wasn't going to be out there to do it to somebody else again. The fact that Mo Gibbs is going to be in prison, it was finally over with. We could finally go on and just try to get through life the rest of the time that we had. Mo got what he deserved. Because of Mindy's actions and her strength, we were able to get the DNA that we needed and that DNA helped us solve this case. Though justice is served, nothing can dull the pain of Mindy's loss. Oh, I miss Mindy so much every day. You never get over it, but you go on and you pray for that time when you can see her again up there in in the heavens. That's where I know where she's at. I like to remember her smile. I have a picture of her on my refrigerator. and The light just radiates from her face. And she's so happy. And that's the way I like to remember her. An ambitious, popular young restaurant manager She was a tremendous young person who had unlimited potential. We always saw it just like the world on fire. Is found beaten, stabbed, and suffocated. The person who did this absolutely wanted to guarantee that she was dead. Whoever did it ransacked the safe. Something that brutal had to be more than just a robbery. Detectives uncover a history of workplace conflict. He didn't like to be told what to do. He scared me. I was uncomfortable around him. For me, that was a red flag. With the community on edge, another attack leaves them living in fear. It was such a similar homicide, a lone female employee and the use of a knife. You don't know if somebody's lurking out there and they're going to do it again. 
and new evidence confirms disturbing suspicions. The lab informed me that there was a match. I just couldn't believe what was happening. Like, when am I going to wake up? Terry's murder wasn't what it appeared to be. Falls Township, Pennsylvania is a family-friendly suburb with blue-collar roots. Falls Township is a community in Lower Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It was built up around the U.S. steel mill in the 1950s. Steel workers moved out here from different parts of the country, and it was a nice community. Although we're a suburb of Philadelphia and we're right across the river from Trenton, violent crime is relatively unusual in Falls. That all changes one Saturday morning with a gruesome discovery at a fast food restaurant. On the morning of February 4th, 1984, the manager arrived to open the restaurant and upon entering, they discovered that someone was laying outside the kitchen area and obviously deceased. The manager recognizes the woman as the restaurant's night shift manager, 25-year-old Terry Brooks. He observed Terry Brooks laying on the floor in a pool of blood with a knife stuck in her neck. And he phoned the dispatcher and stayed on the phone until officers got there. I was told that they had a homicide at the Roy Rogers restaurant on Route 1, so I was there pretty quickly. Her body was positioned near the kitchen. There was a butcher knife sticking out of her neck. She had black and blue marks and bruises everywhere. And it looked like hand marks around her neck, like she had been strangled. It was thought that she was still alive until the bag was put over her head because of the moisture in it from her breath. She looked like she had blood under her fingernails and blood on her hand, and that was wrapped in an evidence bag and secured. There was a rectangular kitchen prep area. That's where you could see both her shoes that were against the wall. To my mind, that was probably the first act of violence that took place that she was literally pushed right out of her shoes uh, and that a struggle had taken place right there. Moving around the corner is where the body was found. It looked like her body had been dragged on the floor to where she laid. Terry had her winter coat on and her bag was also on the floor like she was getting ready to leave. Further examination of the scene reveals evidence of another crime. In the office, the safe was open. There was a register drawer on the desk. The coins were scattered all over the floor. It just appeared that whoever did it ransacked the safe. There was money taken. It had all the earmarkings of a robbery homicide. It was fairly easy for the restaurant to get a count of what was missing, and it was around $2,500. Looking for more clues, detectives speak to the manager who discovered Terry's body. When the manager of the restaurant arrived around 6 in the morning, he found the inner vestibule door locked. The door to the interior of the building was locked, but the drive through window was partially open. It appeared that the killer had left through the drive through window because the metal pipe that was laid in the track as the kind of security measure to lock it up had been removed and laid to the side. But there was no sign of forced entry in the restaurant. Police believe Terry was killed sometime after midnight when the restaurant had closed. As detectives continue to process the crime scene, Terry's family discovers that she never returned home from work. The morning of the murder, Scott, the victim's fiance, knocks on the door to the Brooks family home. At the time, Terry lived with her parents. We hear a banging at the door, and it was Scott standing there, and he's like, Terry's car's not in the driveway. He tells them that he was driving by their house on his way to work and that he noticed Terry's car wasn't there. They then looked in her room and saw that, in fact, she wasn't home. And then Scott picked up the phone and dialed the Ray Rogers. And he, he goes, this is George Brooks, Terry Brooks' father. You know, she didn't come home last night. Is she okay? And they said, no, she's not. She, you know, has been murdered. I was kind of shocked they told him over the phone, but I just couldn't believe what was happening. Like, when am I going to wake up? It's, it's a horrible thing. I was getting ready to go to work when my phone rang, 
I was getting a call from her stepmother to tell me so that I wouldn't see it on the news, and my heart just sunk. Terry Brooks grew up in Warminster, Pennsylvania, the oldest of four children. My mom and dad divorced. Terry was in eighth grade, and she kind of took over the mother role after that happened. Out of all of us, she was probably the most ambitious. We always thought, you know, Terry would have her own business one day, and she'd just light the world on fire. Terry took jobs in the restaurant industry and earned a reputation as a hard worker. I worked with Terry at an Italian restaurant. In the beginning, she was a server. I tended bar. She became management after working there for a while. She really, really took pride in her work and how she dealt with people. Soon after her promotion, she began a year-long romance with her co-worker, Scott Keith. She met Scott at the restaurant. He was the head chef. They had a good time together. Terry just came home one day with a ring on her finger, and we were all like, oh, my God. <laughs> While Terry planned her dream wedding for the upcoming summer, her career also started to take off. It was her dream to move forward to bigger things in the hotel business. And she had looked into getting a job with the Marriott Corporation. The positions she accepted with the Marriott was to be a manager of a Roy Rogers restaurant. I first met Terry when I started working at the Roy Rogers. She was my boss. She was always happy. She was very excited about her wedding, and she was excited to go dress shopping. I know she put the down payment on the honeymoon to Hawaii, and she was talking about the bridesmaid dresses. Terry and Scott were apartment hunting. There was a lot to do. It was at a time when all new things were happening in her life. Now, detectives must determine who could have killed this ambitious young woman just a few months before her wedding. They asked the family about Terry's movements in the hours leading up to her murder. Mr. and Mrs. Brooks last saw Terry the day before, Friday, February 3rd, 1984, when she left work. Usually, her fiancé, Scott, would make sure that he went and closed with her every night, and uh, her father was glad that Scott would go and close with her and be there to keep her safe. Scott was worried about Terry's security at the restaurant. He would go and sit with her while she finished everything up. Scott tells police he wasn't with Terry the night before. He had stayed home because he was working the early shift the following morning. Neither Scott nor Terry's parents are able to provide police with any leads. The family was really cooperative with the uh, investigation. and was just nothing that they could volunteer or give us that would indicate that they knew anything about the case. It was completely out of the blue. There was no reason for them to feel that she was in any danger or in any jeopardy. I couldn't think of anybody who really disliked Terry, and I can't imagine anybody would dislike her that much to kill her. Investigators turned their attention to Terry's co-workers. It looked like it could possibly be a, a robbery, but the deeper we looked and the, to see how brutally she was murdered, it had to be more than just a robbery. Detectives want to know how Terry was thought of by her colleagues. Terry was a young woman who was very staunch about the procedures, and she enforced them strictly. She was a by-the-book person, and as long as you did your work the way you were supposed to, there were no problems. When police ask if Terry's management style made her any enemies, one name keeps coming up. Steve Daly was an employee that didn't adhere to the procedures. He was a little hot-headed. Steve scared me, to be honest. He was um, very rough, quick to anger. I was uncomfortable around him. Detectives learn that just weeks before the murder, the tension between Terry and Steve hit a breaking point. He ended up getting fired and wasn't too happy about it. You've got this former employee who had a clear animus towards the victim and is fired by the victim. 
and add to that that here's an employee who knows how the restaurant operates, who knows the security procedures. He's got the kind of knowledge to be able to commit this crime. So this is somebody who now rises to the top of the list. Coming up, police zero in on a suspect. Fingerprints were found on one of the murder weapons. At that point, he admitted he took the money from the office. But conflicting statements frustrate detectives. It was completely a misdirection, a diversion. How could somebody do this and get away with it? Until the investigation takes a jaw-dropping turn. The polygraph operator said he was lying. It caught me by surprise. I remember him all of a sudden blowing up. It was the turning point in the investigation. Police investigating the fatal stabbing of 25-year-old restaurant manager Terry Brooks have learned that a disgruntled co-worker lashed out at Terry before he was fired. If you threaten somebody and they end up dead, you'd have to look at them and look at them seriously. Steve Daly was a former Marine and had a difficult personality. He didn't like to be told what to do. Just weeks before the murder, Terry and Steve had a major blowout. There was an occasion at work where Steve Daly was told to make a hamburger for a customer. And he had just closed out that workspace. So he didn't want to reopen the workspace. And I remember him all of a sudden blowing up. Steve lost his temper, was screaming and yelling. He became explosive at one point, even calling Terry a bitch. Terry was alarmed by Daly's behavior. Terry, in a situation like what happened with Steve. She wouldn't tolerate it. She didn't waver. So I think that was the frustrating thing for Steve is he couldn't break her. And she was like, you need to go home. You are done for the night and you will talk to the boss the next morning. Daly storms out of the restaurant and the next day Terry talks to her manager, tells him what had happened, which of course led to uh, Daly being fired. That did little to stop Steve's aggressive behavior. Even after he was fired, Daly would return to the restaurant and buy food and have meals there. He went back just to annoy her, just, here I am, you can't throw me out now. It was very upsetting to her. So given his personality and his conduct, that certainly seems to provide a motive. Did Steve Daly's harassment escalate into a fatal act of revenge? Police bring him in for an interview. When we tracked Daly down, one of the first things he tells us that he knew at some point the police would be coming to talk to him. Daly uh, said that he didn't get along with Terry, that they clashed often. In fact, he said that if uh, she'd been a man, he would have punched her. Daly's excuse for why he was going back to the restaurant was that he was dating somebody who worked there. I don't know that I buy that, uh, but that's the reason he gave. Investigators ask where Steve was the night of the murder. He says that he was trying to get into a club and that he was not permitted access to the club. So then he just drove around for several hours. Investigators go to the club. They look at the security footage. They can't find any footage of Daly being denied entry. So this is not a hard alibi that can allow you to say, okay, this person's eliminated. Just the opposite. With no way to prove his whereabouts when Terry was killed, police ask Steve to take a polygraph. So a polygraph is a useful investigative tool. It can help us rule people in or out. So Daly agrees to take the polygraph, and without question, he passed. This guy looks like a good suspect. So when you have momentum build like that, and then it crashes to a halt, it's hard to swallow. Police can't verify Steve's alibi, but with no evidence against him, he's free to go. Stephen Daly was pushed down lower on the list of suspects but you never eliminate somebody until you make sure that they are completely not involved. Investigators turn their focus on the Roy Rogers staff who worked with Terry the night of the murder. During the investigation, we knew that we had to interview the employees to see what the atmosphere was when they left, if there was any arguments. Everybody consented to to have their fingerprints taken. The evening that Terry was murdered, There were four employees that she was working with, Patricia, Ron, Barb, and Dan. And each of those employees was identified and interviewed separately. 
Patricia tells investigators that just before closing, Terry discovered that money had gone missing from Barb's cash register. The employees got in an argument and there was $40 that was supposedly missing. Terry was going to get to the bottom of this. It wasn't a minor event. She took it very seriously. She began questioning different employees. You know, where did it go? Uh, why is it missing? Terry played everything by the book. If there's any money missing and you are caught being the person that's been uh, hitting the till, there's no tolerance for stealing. Terry cared about her employees, but some people didn't like her because she could be tough when she needed to be tough. Patricia indicated that this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. If you're stealing money from Roy Rogers and you're an employee there, that's a fireable offense. So did this provide a motive for murder? As Terry attempted to unmask the thief, the employees began to point fingers. Barb told Terry that she thought Ron did it. So he's now being confronted with the idea that he took this money and he actually turned his pockets inside out to prove, hey, he, he didn't have any cash on him. Could Ron have killed Terry in a rage after being accused of stealing? As detectives look closer at Ron, fingerprint analysis provides crucial new evidence. The employees who worked that night clean up before they close. Working the later shift, you had to clean up everything, wash all the equipment, sweep them out the floors, wipe down all the tables, stuff like that. So I thought that whoever was in there after closing could have possibly left fingerprints. We began matching up fingerprints that they'd lifted from different services to elimination prints to take, taken from different employees. And it was discovered that Ron's fingerprints were found on the drive through window and on the trash bag that was wrapped around Terry's face. Here we go. This is somebody that we need to look at. Investigators working to solve the Terry Brooks homicide have just got a match for fingerprints left at the crime scene. The evening that Terry was murdered, there were four employees that she was working with, including an uh, employee named Ron, and Ron's fingerprints were found on the drive through window and on the trash bag that was wrapped around Terry's face. Detectives ask Ron how his fingerprints ended up on the bag used to suffocate Terry and on the drive through window, the killer's likely escape route. Ron said that one of his responsibilities at the restaurant was to take care of the trash. So his fingerprints would have been on that bag because that was part of his job there. Ron also said that he'd covered for some other employees uh, for their break time at the drive through So that's why his print was there on the window. Police aren't able to determine if the window had been properly cleaned at closing. So Ron's excuse is plausible. Still, detectives want to know his whereabouts after he left work. Ron said that he left the restaurant shortly after one in the morning with co-workers and that he got home about 1.15 and talked to his mom before he went to bed. We checked out Ron's alibi, discovered that he had indeed gotten home and stayed home all night. With Ron all but cleared, police get new details from another employee about the money that had gone missing from Barb's cash register. We learned the $40 that was supposedly missing, it was found at a later time. The missing money had mysteriously reappeared in the drop safe. I think it's fair to say that Terry might have thought that it was Barb who had taken this money. My impression was that Terry was suspicious of Barb. Police also learned that it was Barb's duty to close down the drive through Those two things combined, the missing $40 and the fact that it was Barb's responsibility to lock that drive through window and that ultimately it's found unlocked and it's believed to be where the killer left puts her at the top of the suspect list. According to the work schedule, Barb and Terry were the last two employees at the restaurant. The policy of Roy Rogers for employees that were going to work past the end of their shift was that they would lock the doors and that there would be a minimum of two employees there. Could an argument between Terry and Barb over the missing money have turned deadly? Barb said that she was sent home early by Terry. And she was insistent that she close the window and place the pipe in the track to lock. And in looking into Barb's whereabouts, we discovered that she was picked up by her boyfriend. So she had an alibi. So it's conceivable that Terry was alone in the restaurant, working into the early hours of February 4th doing inventory. Police later confirmed the alibis of every employee who worked the night of the murder. 
When the autopsy report arrives, investigators hope it will give them a new lead. The pathologist found that Terry had uh, been strangled and the bone in the back of her neck was severed from the stab wound. There was a serious brain hemorrhage that was the result of her head being repeatedly banged against that hard concrete floor. And looking at that stab wound to her spine, it was likely she was conscious but paralyzed when the plastic trash bag was wrapped around her head. The autopsy report lists each of Terry's severe injuries as potentially fatal, but indicates asphyxiation as the likely cause of death. There was no indication that Terry had been sexually assaulted. You can't help but look at the way that Terry was killed and not think that the person who did this had such a high level of rage that they absolutely wanted to guarantee that she was dead. Material was collected from the knife that was left lodged in Terry's throat and under Terry's right ring finger, where the pathologist had identified a defensive wound. At the time of this murder in 1984, there was no DNA technology. Analysis of blood was really relegated to blood typing. By today's standards, the evidence was, was limited. As the investigation continues, Terry's loved ones struggle to make sense of her violent death. The funeral home called the, the morning of the viewing, and they said, you know, could somebody come down and take a look at Terry? And they had her laid out in the casket, and it, she just, it, she didn't look good. You could see the cut marks in her neck, and you could see the bruises on the, you know, the back of her hand, and they had makeup on her, too, and you could still see. It, it, she didn't, it didn't look like Terry. You know, I said when I got home to my dad, I think we should keep the casket closed. We didn't want people to remember her uh, looking like that. As the Brooks family prepares to bury their eldest daughter, Falls Township lives in fear of a brutal killer still at large. It was a young person that was killed, you know, at her job. So I think the community as a whole regarded this as a, a frightening homicide. It caused quite a bit of fear due to the fact that it was so violent. And most people in this area would think this shouldn't happen in our town. I just really just thought it, yeah, it probably was, uh, you know, a robbery. Unfortunately, they killed her instead of just robbing the place. But you don't know if somebody's lurking out there, you know, and they're going to do it again. Less than two weeks after Terry's murder, the town's worst fear appears to become a horrifying reality. At another Roy Rogers, an assistant manager was attacked coming out of the bathroom. She was hit in the head. She fell to the floor, and the actor ran away before she could identify him. The restaurant manager survives. But just a week later in nearby Scranton, there's another brutal attack. A male attacker waited in the parking lot until there was a lone female employee, then made entry into the restaurant. But the money from the restaurant had already been dropped into the safe, so he took the female employee's money uh, and then stabbed her to death. Detectives fear they have a serial killer on the loose. And when you take a community that was already stressed, it made it even worse. And if you've got an individual who's going from restaurant to restaurant and just robbing people, and they have no personal connection to the victim, it's terrifying. It took it up a notch. Three weeks after the murder of Terry Brooks, police have learned another restaurant employee has been stabbed to death in nearby Scranton. Scranton's is just up the turnpike and it's not really that far from us. So anything that would indicate a violent armed robbery, we would have to look into. It was such a similar homicide, a lone female employee inside a restaurant, a male attacker, and the use of a knife. Investigators learn that a suspect has already been arrested. Could he also be Terry Brooks's killer? The person that committed this homicide in Scranton was a man named Steve Duffy. We sent investigators to go to Scranton to attempt to interview Duffy. And by the time we arrive, he has lawyered up. But we got a warrant to obtain his fingerprints and compare them to the fingerprints from the scene. But in the end, the fingerprint comparison indicated no connection to the homicide at Arbery Rogers. Police are also unable to identify a suspect in the assault of the manager at the other Roy Rogers location. 
You go through this cycle of building momentum, and then you hit a wall. It's disheartening. It's been a month since Terry Brooks was found dead, and the killer is still at large. Something that brutal and that terrifying, you have to try to solve it, no matter how long it takes. But when the leads start running out, you get awful upset. As weeks turn to months, and you identify suspects and then eliminate them over and over again, the case went cold. An investigator, by necessity, has to move on to other cases. But for a family that loses a loved one to a homicide, they don't move on. When it first happened, you just assumed that it was going to be solved. You think, well, how could somebody do this and get away with it? My dad's hair turned white within a year. He lost weight. He just, it, it just destroyed him. It was hard for Terry's family. Having to process the heartache of losing their daughter and not having closure over it. I couldn't imagine not having answers. There are no significant developments in the investigation for nearly 14 years. Then, in 1998, Falls Township's new police chief orders a fresh look at the Terry Brooks murder, and a local prosecutor is assigned to the case. One of the primary reasons that the police chief put this renewed focus on this case was that there had been developments in DNA technology during the 1990s. And part of the point of my assignment to have someone come in with a fresh point of view, it was just a matter of reviewing all of those reports and reviewing all the physical evidence. It caught me by surprise a bit when I opened up the bag that contained Terry's wallet. I found that you could still clearly smell Terry's perfume. And because I wasn't expecting it, it's one of those things that sort of triggers your emotions and brings you closer to the victim. A team is assembled for the renewed investigation. Lori said, uh, take a look at uh, this homicide. And she asked me what I thought, and apparently my answers were uh, well enough to, to get me assigned to work on it. At the time that the homicide occurred, other robberies at fast food restaurants in the area caused law enforcement to form the initial theory that it was likely to have been a robbery. We had the advantage of knowing that the robbery homicide track didn't work out, so you know we, we could start with a different theory. There were two things that really jumped out. One, that we could conduct victimology interviews and talk to some people who weren't interviewed back at the time. And two, develop some kind of forensic signature for the killer. As the lab works to extract the killer's DNA from crime scene evidence, investigators learn more about the victim, Terry Brooks. Victimology essentially means learning everything you possibly can about the victim. Everybody who we spoke to described Terry Brooks as intelligent, ambitious, friendly, well-loved by her family and friends. Detective Whitney spent a lot of time with the family to gain their trust and to reassure them that we were working on the case diligently. Nelson and Lori did seem like the power couple. Both of them are extremely intelligent, and they were driven to get this solved. Detectives hope new interviews will bring to light crucial details that could help the case. You just never know when you're going to get some new piece of information that's going to put us on a track to identify who did this. Some of the people who we spoke to they were quite young when this homicide occurred, in their late teens or early 20s, and having more life experience were a bit more open than they might have felt they could be in the 1980s. Detectives reach out to people who weren't interviewed in the 1984 investigation, including those who worked with Terry before her employment at Roy Rogers. I got a call from Falls Township Police they wanted to speak to me about the Terry Brooks murder. And they just said to me, we'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Cindy knew Terry well. They worked together. And Cindy kind of laid out what was going on in the victim's life. During her interview with investigators, Cindy drops a bombshell. What Cindy told us presented a completely different image of this homicide. It turned out Terry's murder 
wasn't what it appeared to be. And now you couldn't help but conclude everything's pointing to one person. Fourteen years after the murder of Terry Brooks, cold case investigators have just received shocking new information from a friend and former co-worker of Terry's. We asked what things did Terry share with, you know, Cindy as a friend. And I said to them, Terry and her fiancé Scott, their upcoming wedding at first was exciting for Terry. But I proceeded to tell them that the week before Terry had been murdered, she wanted to call off the wedding. She just realized that's not what she wanted. We knew Terry and Scott had just put down a deposit on their honeymoon, and their wedding was upcoming. And in the initial investigation, the officers that conducted it came away with the impression that they were a happy couple. There hadn't really been anything in the report that indicated there were any problems in Terry Brooks's relationship with Scott Keefe. But we did learn that Terry confided to some of her friends that she wasn't entirely sure she was going to go through with getting married. Mr. and Mrs. Brooks felt close to Scott. He was the young man that was going to marry their daughter. To her parents, Scott was this loving, caring fiancé who would uh, check on Terry and drive by to make sure she was you know, safe and give her rides. Some of Terry's friends had a very different impression of Scott. Cindy Bradney told us that there had been some problems in the relationship. For me, that was a red flag. I think through time and her changing jobs and the fact that she was moving on and going for her dream and he was stuck where he was, his jealousy became an issue and he was very possessive. Scott would not let Terry stay alone. She was afraid to tell him she didn't want to be married. She was afraid to call it off. She didn't know what she was going to do, to the point where she was in tears. Police get further insight into Terry and Scott's relationship from Terry's siblings. When she started dating Scott, we just were all scratching our heads, like, what is she doing with him? He was just not the kind of guy she always dated. He wasn't fun-loving. All he wanted to do was sit there and drink. And that was just unlike her. It just seemed like he wanted to keep us away from her and him. It just makes you think back, like maybe he did have signs of an abusive person. But at the time, I just really thought it was a robbery and she was killed during the robbery. Detectives have a new perspective on Scott and how the supposedly grieving fiance might have avoided suspicion at the time of Terry's death. My dad thought Scott really loved Terry. He thought if she loved him, you know, I'll love him too. Mr. Brooks was a very kind man. And in fact, George bought Scott the suit that he wore to Terry's funeral. Her father just had such a big heart that I don't think he believed that someone that his daughter fell in love with could harm her. And I believe Scott played on that. Scott becomes someone that we think may have done this. Examining the crime scene through the lens of, what if Scott did this? Okay, that's how he got in. She let him in. We were told that he had a practice of going to the restaurant and sitting with her while she worked after hours. And it's personal, it's rage. And then the action of, of placing that bag over her face uh, to kind of depersonalize her is, is a telltale mark of what someone does when they've killed somebody that they're close to. And now it becomes a priority for us to see if, if the forensic track, if the evidence points that way. Investigators hope the killer's DNA can be extracted from the crime scene evidence collected back in 1984. It was a potential concern that they might not be able to find any usable DNA due to the amount of time that had gone by. Luckily, the knife that was left lodged in Terry's throat and the material collected from under Terry's right ring finger where the pathologist had identified a defensive wound to that area yielded an unknown male DNA profile. 
It was highly unlikely under the circumstances that that DNA material would have come from anyone other than the perpetrator. The next thing we had to do was obtain a DNA sample from our suspect. Scott Keefe did not have a criminal record at that time. He didn't have any DNA samples on file with an agency such as the FBI. One of the things that we learned from the laboratory expert was that cigarette butts are an excellent potential source of DNA because they have saliva on them. And at that point, we actually knew what kind of cigarettes he smoked, and we knew where he lived. Police hatch a plan to secretly obtain a sample of Scott Keefe's DNA. We didn't at that point want to obtain a subpoena to obtain DNA from him directly because we wanted to interview him first. We wanted to set that up in the most advantageous possible way and we were concerned that he was a flight risk. It was very important to us to be very careful about who knew he was a suspect and who we shared that information with. And it was also very important to us to to not be uh, caught doing surveillance. In 1998, Scott's life had kind of come full circle from where it was in 1984. In 1984, he was living at home with his parents. He had gone on to live with a girlfriend and then marry. They'd had a child together. But then they split up and got divorced, and in 1998, he was back home living with his mom. Under Pennsylvania law, trash was considered to be abandoned property once it was put out in front of the house for collection. So Detective Whitney immediately took custody of it, took it directly to the laboratory that was doing the DNA analysis. I knew I was going to get a definitive answer one way or the other could be him, could be somebody else. It was that anticipation of, I'm going to get a final result here that's going to matter a great deal in this investigation. Police investigating the 1984 murder of Terry Brooks have secretly collected a DNA sample from her fiancé, Scott Keith. We had to obtain a DNA sample from our suspect. So we collected cigarette butts that were in the trash. The sample is compared to DNA found on Terry's body. I'll never forget the phone call I got where the doctor at the lab informed me that there was a match from Scott's cigarettes to the crime scene evidence. It was the turning point in the investigation. That was the point at which we knew we would be able to prove that Scott Keefe was the killer. Although we had very solid physical evidence against Keefe, it's always better if you have an incriminating statement from the defendant. We asked Mr. Keefe to come to the police station as one of the friends and family members that we were interviewing as part of our investigation. We believed that he would cooperate with us. We believed that he would come across as wanting to help, that he would try to sell us the same story, that he was the grieving fiancé, you know, that he'd been telling people for 15 years. As predicted, Scott agrees to cooperate with police. We had a strategy to conduct that interview on the anniversary date of the murder. People pay attention to dates. It could raise a person's anxiety level and make them more apt to make mistakes. The interview begins, and Scott tells a familiar tale. He told us the same story that that he had told others over the years, that they were happy, this was the love of his life, and that somebody else had taken her away from him. If we came on too hard, we were too aggressive in our questioning, we felt he would lawyer up and stop the interview. So slowly we built towards the question of whether Scott had anything to do with this or any knowledge of it. And once we got to that point, we asked Scott if he would take a polygraph. You can never force anyone to undergo a polygraph examination, but he agreed to that. The polygraph operator said he was lying. So now Scott started to say things like, I didn't mean for this to happen. But then he caught himself and said, but I didn't do it. But over time, that culminated at one point in him saying, she came at me first. And that was the first time he put himself at the scene. 
Investigators keep the pressure on. And finally, Scott breaks. He admitted that she essentially told him that she wanted to break up with him. And he was enraged because of that. At one point, we punched her in the face. They struggled for a while in that kitchen prep area. A knife had fallen onto the floor, and uh, he knocked her down and straddled her, choking her and banging her head repeatedly against the floor. But then he grabbed the knife and stabbed her with it, and it stuck in her throat. Then, in his words, he bent over to make sure she was dead, saw that she was still breathing, so he grabbed the uh, trash can liner to wrap around her face to make sure that she would, in fact, die, and he said he didn't want to look at her face. At that point, he admitted he took the money from the office. He said he exited to the drive through window to make it look like a robbery. Scott told us that the reason he went to the Brooks family home uh, the morning of the murder was to make him look innocent. So he's surrounded by her family when the crime is supposedly discovered. It was completely a misdirection, a diversion that worked for 15 years for him. Scott is charged with first-degree murder. I was elated. I was like, thank God they finally nailed him. We waited a long time. Getting the answers of who killed my sister really gave my dad some comfort. But I think he was still in disbelief that Scott did it. We were just so happy we could tell her family that the person who had killed their daughter was in prison, and we were confident he was going to be convicted. At trial, Scott Keefe is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Terry was a tremendous young person who had unlimited potential. She had good relationships with her family. It's really a terrible tragedy that her life ended this way. It's just so sad that somebody so young, because of standing up for themselves and wanting to move forward in their lives, gets their life cut short. Terry would have had a very bright future, and I'm sure she would have had a ton of kids, and we'd be hanging out right now. Terry would love to be remembered with those big eyes, that smile, her kindness in her heart, and the person with a goal. She was truly a lovely, lovely person. A loving mother with a selfless spirit. I remember her laughter. You could hear mother laughing from two rooms away. She was really representative of the goodness in people. She loved her community. They loved her. Is stabbed to death in a horrifying attack. It was gruesome crime scene. There was a lot of blood. The perpetrator left the victim with a two-pronged serving fork sticking out of her throat. The amount of devastation led us to believe that it definitely was a crime of passion. Suspicion falls on those closest to her. He was the husband that last saw her alive. He didn't really show any signs of grieving. He failed the polygraph. My first thought was that it was a domestic assault. Her son had had an argument with his mother that morning. A neighbor had seen a teenager running away from the home that day. Months go by without an arrest. We kept wondering, why is it so hard to capture a murderer in this small town? Then, just as the case is in danger of going cold, police uncover a dire warning. The note threatened more violence. That leads to a deranged killer no one could have predicted. Wow, we didn't see that coming. Shenandoah, Iowa, is a close-knit farming community, home to just 5,500 people. Shenandoah is your typical small town. It's just beautiful. The corn surrounding the towns. Everybody knows one another. 
you just are almost shocked at how nice folks are. It's a, a small, peaceful community. People know their neighbors, take care of each other. You don't have a lot of violent crime of any nature. The peace is shattered on September 6th, 1988, when police get a disturbing call from local pastor Robert Borton at 3.40 p.m. He tells police his wife of 19 years, Cindy, is dead. He found her body in the kitchen, lying in a pool of her own blood. He called authorities who arrived immediately and kept him outside of the house. It was gruesome crime scene. We found a female on the kitchen floor. There was a lot of blood everywhere. This person had been stabbed many, many times. The perpetrator left the victim lying on her back in a pool of blood with a two-pronged serving fork sticking out of her throat. That image uh, stayed with me because it was remarkable in its uh, gruesomeness. There were four instruments that appeared to come from uh, her kitchen that were uh, weapons of convenience for the killer. There were two forks, a large two-pronged fork, a four-pronged fork, as well as two knives. There was a struggle. Uh, there were some cuts on her hand where she had fought the person and she had uh, tried to get away from the person. The phone had been ripped off of the wall uh, and it was obvious that a lot of activity went on while Cindy was being killed. Detectives observed that the pool of blood is not yet dry, meaning the murder likely happened in the late morning or early afternoon. In addition to the blood in the kitchen, there were also some blood stains found in the bathroom. It was obvious that the person had cleaned up uh, in the bathroom because uh, there wasn't any visible uh, pools of blood, just uh, blood that looked like it had been uh, washed off of uh, hands or, or clothing. We did not have the benefit of DNA testing back in the 80s. Blood would have been collected still um, because you can type the blood and that was what was uh, one thing that we'd be looking at. And of course, fingerprints obviously throughout the crime scene. There was no forced entry. We were 99% sure that uh, she knew who the perpetrator was. My first thought was that it was a family assault. The amount of devastation that was there at the crime scene uh, led us to believe that it definitely was a crime of passion. Detectives had to speak with Cindy's husband, Robert, but are beaten to it by a new arrival at the scene, the couple's 18-year-old son. I seen an ambulance parked in front of my house and my father was leaning against the front of my mother's car crying and I just knew deep down inside me that my world was never going to be the same. I dropped my backpack there in the middle of the yard and went running up to my father and he then informed me that Mama was gone. 39 year old Cynthia Borden was a born and bred Iowa girl. She and her brother were raised by loving parents just outside Des Moines. My mother and my uncle would always tell me about the adventures that they had around the farm. Life was good for them. Everybody had to laugh, according to Mama. I remember her laughter. You could hear mother laughing from two rooms away. You would have to rush in there to find out what it was that was so funny that made mama laugh. As a teen, Cindy worked at a local restaurant and soon after would meet her future husband. My father wound up coming in there and doing the whole phone number exchange thing and then they started going out and one thing led to another. The couple married in 1969. When the family moved to Shenandoah, Cindy had her hands full. Mama just kind of assumed the role of the pastor's wife. She also worked at a donut place there 
Mama always did what she had to do to take care of the family. I was her everything. I was very much a mama's boy. My mother was love personified. Cindy's warm heart also extended to those outside the family. Mama always had an open door policy for all of my friends. They always knew that my mother was there to be a second mother to them, somebody that they could talk to that she never passed judgment on anybody. She was also very good with giving out the hugs. Mama was always there to give you a hand back up if life knocked you down. Cindy loved her community. They loved her. She was really representative of a small town in Iowa. The goodness in people. Cindy's death leaves many in the community wondering who could have killed her. Investigators have an idea on where to start. Back in that time, about 85% of all homicides in the state of Iowa were committed by someone close to the victim. A uh, husband is always a major suspect at the time we see a homicide like this, especially one with uh, so much rage involved. Robert was interviewed and gave the following timeline. He had gone to work that morning at Select Motors, where he was a part-time worker because preaching to a small rural congregation is not lucrative employment. Robert returned home at noon, as was his habit. His wife served him spaghetti for lunch, and at one o'clock he returned to work. Cindy uh, worked at a local bakery. Her shift was to start at two o'clock that day. When she didn't show up for work, her employer became concerned and called Robert. He indicated that he thought perhaps she had simply taken a nap and overslept. Approximately an hour or so later, when she still had not shown up for work, he got the second phone call from his wife's employer. He went home at about 3.30 in the afternoon to discover Cindy dead on the kitchen floor. What Robert says he did next raises a red flag to detectives. After finding his wife and then calling to get some help, he took the dog out instead of, you know, being there for his wife or trying to do something for his wife. He said he wanted it to be tied up so that the ambulance people wouldn't have to deal with his pets. That was very unusual and very strange. Then, Robert offers up a theory investigators find completely ludicrous. Bob was saying that his wife could have just tripped and fell uh, onto this fork. That was totally not plausible. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. It's just, I, I can't imagine anyone you know, ending up in a situation, and certainly not with the amount of blood that was found there at the scene, too. He thought that it was an accident. And that really raised eyebrows. How could you possibly think that someone had just fallen? You just think, well, this is someone who snapped. Bob Borton was our prime suspect immediately after the death of Cynthia Borton because, first of all, he was the last person to see her alive, and then he also was the one that found her. Coming up, suspicion swells around Cindy's husband. His work clothing was laundered before investigators had an opportunity to examine it for blood spatter. What does Robert Borton have to hide? The only thing I want him to say is, I did it. While police dig for evidence against their top suspect, a threatening clue sends shockwaves through the town. There were a great many different and wild rumors. Leaving notes at the scene, Cindy Morton ain't nothing compared to what's coming. And hints such as the NS Night Stalker. This story just got even more crazy and more sensational and more scary. Police in Shenandoah, Iowa, are investigating the gruesome murder of 39-year-old Cynthia Borton. Her husband Robert's erratic behavior is putting him in detective spotlight. Robert commented that his wife had simply fallen on an observing fork and died an accidental death. Uh, these comments uh, were certainly unusual. 
and suspicious. Police bring Robert to the station for a formal interview. Bob did have a, a very strange personality and strange uh, mannerisms about him when he was interviewed. Um, uh, he didn't really show any signs of grieving. You would have expected that uh, a man uh, having just lost his wife would be very emotional at the time he was being interviewed, but we didn't see that with Bob Borton. He was very matter of fact. He was just so casual in talking even about finding his wife. He acted like that was just everyday thing. You know, it's just like talking about, well, what's the weather gonna be like today? Detectives questioned Robert about his relationship with Cindy. He told us about, you know, having arguments once in a while. He went in kind of a defensive mode about the questioning. When they're reacting like that, it does put up a red flag like that. Investigators try to provoke a telling reaction out of Robert. He didn't get upset uh, when I accused him of being the one responsible for his wife's death. He didn't show sadness. He didn't cry. His stoic uh, but un unemotional uh, denials uh, only increased their suspicions. At that point in time, Bob Borton couldn't be held at all. We had no evidence to show that he was responsible. We had no information other than his matter-of-fact attitude. Robert provides fingerprint samples, but with nothing concrete linking him to the murder, investigators must let him go. This, frankly, was frustrating to some of the investigators involved in the case. Cindy's body has been sent to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. While police wait to learn a specific time of death, they look to verify Robert's whereabouts. His boss alibied him for the time uh, that he said that he was at work that day. Knowing it's still possible Robert killed Cindy when he went home on his lunch break at noon, what his boss tells detectives next rings alarm bells. He changed his clothes when he went back to work. Before the body was found, he dropped off his work clothing. It was laundered uh, before investigators had an opportunity to examine it for blood spatter. Had this all been part of Robert's well-executed plan? There isn't always transfer of blood from a victim to a perpetrator, even in an extremely bloody killing such as this one. But of course, the likelihood that there would be uh, made it important to examine the clothing and uh, that was impossible because those clothes, uh, as it happened, were very quickly laundered. That certainly was a little detail that made us think that it was him. Investigators conducted a great deal of background interviews with neighbors, friends, uh, co-workers. We did look into the relationship between uh, Robert and Cynthia Borton to see if uh, it was a good marriage. And we did determine that they did have some problems. Everything wasn't uh, roses and everything wasn't as you might think. There was quarreling in the house. We thought maybe he had a lot of rage that he wanted to get rid of and he was taking it out on Cindy. But we had never been called there for family disturbance or anything. Needing to verify information about Cindy and Robert's relationship, Detectives seek out their son, John, but the teen has vanished. On the day she passed, all I did was shut down. My best friend, Jim, and his mother and father came driving by in their car and attempted to speak with me. I was not in the mood to talk, and then I just kept on walking. When John arrives back home that night, detectives are there waiting. They wanted everything that I could tell them while it was still all fresh in my mind. My father and I were still of the impression that it could have been accidental. When asked about his parents' relationship, John admits there were problems. There was some disagreements and a little bit of an argument. And then they realized that, could I actually find anybody better for me? And the answer they came up with was no. So it's like, we were happy one time. We need to figure this out, get it worked out. 
that whole part of the wedding vows of till death do us part. They both took that very seriously. John is too upset to say much more. Police and their conversation, but plan to talk with him again when he's less distraught. Officers are then dispatched to canvas the area around the Borden home. They talk to the neighbors and try to find out if there's anybody who witnessed anything suspicious. A neighbor had seen a teenager running away from the home that day, actually in the afternoon. The neighbor's description of the teen sounds strikingly familiar. John Borton, Cynthia's son, fit the description uh, of the person that had run away from the house. Had John come home early from school to murder his own mother? It was a fascinating story. It was a mystery. He seemed like your typical teenager. Bob Borton uh, and also John Borton were the main and only suspects. That in and itself was the shocking part. Detectives investigating the vicious slaying of Cynthia Borton have two prime suspects. Her husband, Robert, who found her dead, and now their 18-year-old son, who matches the description of a teen seen fleeing the area around the time of the murder. John Borton, even though he was uh, scheduled to have been at school that day, might have come home early. So John Borton, early on, was a person that we wanted to talk with and and get more details about uh, where he was on that day. The day after the murder, John is brought to the police department for another interview. They started with the questions about the home life and everything else. I told them my mother was literally my whole world. When detectives ask John about the last time he saw his mother, he makes a startling admission. John indicated in his interview that he had had an argument with his mother that morning. That, of course, was interesting and relevant information. Mother and I did disagree because I was not in the mood to go to school that day. My last words to my mother that day were a bit harsh. I have zero pride or pleasure that I can take from that particular morning. John maintains he was at school the entire day, but he didn't have any classes between noon and 3 p.m., the approximate window of time when detectives suspect Cindy was murdered. The whole tone of the investigation changed. They were considering me personally to be a suspect. Who on earth could think that I would do this to my mother. In a household with three people, uh, the two surviving occupants would always uh, be interviewed and looked at to see if they had an alibi. We tried to determine with anybody at the school to make sure that they saw him there and uh, to make sure that he was in fact in school, not just that he was supposed to be in school, but that people actually did see him there uh, during that day. Investigators took aside two of John's friends, Jim and Jackson, to find out if there was anything that might cause them to be concerned about John as a suspect. The teens can't confirm John was at school the entire day, but they're adamant he's not the killer. One of the first people to console him about his mother's death was Jim Bettis. Friends of John Borton said... Cynthia Borton's murder had been true devastation for John. I heard some of my uh, teachers kind of speaking in kind of a low, hushed tone thing that the detectives had come by and questioned them as to whether or not I was actually at school. Could anybody verify that I was there all day like I was supposed to be? Eventually, they were able to reconstruct my alibi for the entire afternoon. Detectives talked with his teachers who verified that he had spent that full day at school. Cynthia's son, John, is ruled out as a suspect. Three days later, the autopsy report comes in and police look for any insight into what exactly happened that gruesome day. Cindy suffered a horrifying death. The medical examiner found that Cindy had been stabbed 29 times. 
with at least four different instruments, two knives and two serving forks. In addition to stab wounds that directly led to her death by puncturing vital organs, she had defensive wounds on her hands and forearms. She struggled with her assailant. She had to know that she was dying at the hands uh, of her killer. The autopsy report also provides a detail crucial to the investigation. Based upon his finding of a stomach full of completely undigested spaghetti, the medical examiner uh, estimated the time of death as one o'clock in the afternoon. Cindy and Robert had shared a meal of spaghetti between 12 and one o'clock. Robert placed himself in that home alone in his wife's company at the estimated time of death. It really made Bob Borton our prime suspect. He was the husband that last saw her alive. He was the husband that was the first to find her dead on the kitchen floor. Um, he and his wife had had difficulties throughout their marriage, uh, had had problems. Investigators decided that it was important to keep working on Robert. He was really their only feasible suspect. Based on the findings of the autopsy report and mounting circumstantial evidence, Robert is called back in for another interview. One of our agents uh, was very uh, aggressive in, in, in interrogating Bob Borton about his wife's murder and accusing him of being the murderer. And Bob, again, sat very calm and still and was not irate about being accused of having taken his wife's life. The investigators decided to give me a call and ask me to conduct a polygraph examination of Bob Borton and, and do that right away before he had a chance to think twice about it. The relevant questions that I've asked Bob Borton is, were you responsible for your wife's death? Did you cause your wife's death? Did you stab your wife? He was just very humdrum, very relaxed and very, well, you know, I guess, you know, you'll have to do what you have to do because I didn't do it. The polygraph results tell a different story. He failed the polygraph. The results were that he was lying and that he was culpable in this crime. So investigators were, in fact, increasingly convinced that Robert had killed his wife. One week after the gruesome murder of Cindy Borton, her husband Robert, the prime suspect in her murder, has just failed a polygraph. When I did see those results, the thing that next happens is for me to go in and interrogate him and, and, and try to determine why he was being deceptive. I needed to try to get a confession from him. When I confronted him with the results of the polygraph examination, he didn't shake his head no, that he didn't do it. He didn't try to respond to me in any way, shape, or form. He just basically sat in a chair and didn't move. The only thing I want him to say is, I did it. And so we were very aggressive in interrogating Bob Borton about his wife's murder. Robert Borton never wavered in his denial that he was responsible for this. Robert's behavior under questioning becomes even more unusual. He did, in fact, fall asleep in the chair. The only time that anybody has ever fallen asleep in the middle of one of my interrogations. Bob Borton's reactions were not what we would have considered to be normal. Despite failing the polygraph, the evidence against Robert is purely circumstantial, so detectives have no choice but to let him go. At that point in time, we're thinking, we must have missed something. There must be something more involved that we're not aware of. The lack of an arrest unsettles the town further. The people of the community really are concerned when there is an immediate suspect, why that person's not apprehended and, and taken to jail. But we need more information. We need more evidence. The members of the community uh, were increasingly convinced that Robert had killed his wife. Uh, they expressed those concerns. They brought a great deal of pressure on the chief of police. The public was just as uh, anxious to get it solved as the police was. We wanted to get this case cleared up so gossip and things would die down after, of course, this happened. He wasn't preaching for a while, and then 
people just quit attending. There was a uh, real change my father noticed. People who were open and friendly with him, all of a sudden, they quite often would go as far as to cross the street so that they would not have to walk near him, would not have to speak with him. I did my best to at least attempt to continue my life as well as I could. Laying Cindy to rest is tough on the young teen. The only time I can remember my mother having a brand new dress was the one bought for her to bury her in. It's the only brand new dress I ever recall her having. Two months after Cindy's murder, Robert and John leave Shenandoah. It was unbearable for my father to continue to live there. People who he thought had been friends before had shut him out. He moved to a town three hours away, and we watched his movements, where he went, who he was meeting with. The police were really struggling because they had nothing. They had no one else. Two and a half months later, when the state crime lab sends investigators the results of the fingerprint analysis, they hope it'll be the crucial evidence for which they've been waiting. Robert's fingerprints were not found on any of the murder weapons or the phone. This, frankly, was frustrating to some of the investigators involved in the case. It was uh, solid evidence uh, that someone other than Robert Borton was very possibly uh, the guilty party in this murder. The news is a huge blow to the investigation. It's concerning whenever cases are not immediately solvable and as time passes, uh, the prospects for solving them uh, become smaller and smaller. We just waited for authorities to make an arrest. And when they didn't make an arrest in the months that were going by, that's when we started to realize this is somebody that they don't know who it is. Three months after the murder, as detectives redouble their efforts to unearth new suspects, another crime in Shenandoah comes to their attention. In the weeks preceding and following the murder of Cindy Borton, uh, there were arsons in the town of Shenandoah. Even though arson is a different crime than murder, it's a violent crime. And when one has a series of violent crimes, in this case, the arsons and the murder, all occurring within a matter of weeks, uh, it uh, would be only normal to at least examine uh, the possibility of a connection between the two. On November 30th, another arson occurs, and a clue found at the scene leaves investigators stunned. The arsonist left a note uh, referring to the two prior arsons and Cynthia Borton, and in fact threatened more violence in that community, saying that uh, the arsons and Cynthia Borton ain't nothing compared to what's coming. Oh my gosh, this story just got even more crazy and more sensational and more scary. Detectives hunting the killer of Cindy Borden have just received a mysterious clue linking her murder to a series of arson fires across town. There was a note that was, in fact, very intriguing, and the note referred to all three arsons and Cindy Borton, obviously raising the possibility that uh, the perpetrator of the arsons was also the perpetrator of the Cindy Borton murder. The note in question was signed the Night Stalker, N.S., which copied the name of a highly publicized murderer in California. At the time, the Night Stalker had already been arrested, so this was clearly a copycat killer. Uh, it was rather apparent that the perpetrator was someone who used that name out of convenience and uh, imitation. He was calling himself the Night Stalker. Wow, he's just crazy. There were a great many different and wild rumors leaving notes at the scene and hints such as the NS 
Night Stalker were quite possibly a cry for attention. This would have to be investigated. The note uh, was examined for fingerprints and indeed some uh, latent fingerprint ridge detail was found on the note. The prints are sent to the crime lab for analysis. It was important not only to continue investigating the murder, but also to investigate the arsons for purpose of developing a suspect on the murder. There had been three arsons in the community. One had been at the Broad Street School. The letters NS uh, were found slashed on a bridge uh, near the Broad Street School fire. There was another fire set in a school teacher's pickup, and there was a note, the night stalker strikes again. This case was a genuine whodunit. Even though we had the night stalker note, uh, investigators didn't know who had authored it or who had committed the arsons. I never really would have expected uh, this case to go where it went. You know, it uh, wasn't something that we expected from the beginning at all. Several days later, detectives get the fingerprint results from the note, and they don't match back to anyone in their database. There was, in fact, a, a killer at loose in their community. As every week went by, and then the months, we kept wondering, why is it so hard to capture a murderer in this small town who committed a murder in such a shocking, unbelievable manner? On January 31st, 1989, police finally get a break in the case. Five months after this murder, a young man named Jackson, a high school student, came into the police department and informed authorities that the previous day he'd had a visit from a friend, another teenager, and that in the course of their afternoon visiting with each other, uh, this friend had told him that he had some very shocking information and something that was bothering him. More specifically, that he had murdered Cynthia Borton. This information was a shock that shed uh, an entirely uh, new light on the investigation. When Jackson came into the Shenandoah Police Department, yes, that definitely was a big break. His friend had told him things that happened at the crime scene that only the killer would know. Jackson's friend described the murder that he had committed and even went so far as to draw a small diagram indicating exactly where the body had been left in the house. Jackson shared this drawing as well with the authorities, which was important and surprising because it appeared quite accurate. He told Jackson, I'm going to show you where the knife is. And he did that. And that's when Jackson realized, oh, he's really done this. And later that day, even though he was sworn to secrecy, he thought about his own mom and how the killer had been a guest in their house. And he thought, wow, that could have been my mom. So it wasn't hard for him to go to the police after that. At this point, investigators were aware that Jackson had indeed very likely spoken to Cindy Borton's murderer. Jackson said that James Bettis was the one responsible for killing Cynthia Borton. Jim Bettis was a close friend of John Borton. They were classmates until uh, Jimmy dropped out of high school. He was close enough to John and interacted with the Borton so much that Cindy was very involved in Jim's life. He even thought of Cindy as a second mother to him. She tried to help him, tried to persuade him to return to school and get an education. She was a very good friend and mother figure to the young man. Jim was certainly not a suspect up to this point, but his statement to Jackson uh, it rang true. It was well, amazement at that point in time because we talked to James Bettis previously. James Bettis became the prime suspect because of his admissions to his friend, but we need more corroboration. Jim was taken to the Shenandoah Police Department and he was interviewed. Jim did confess to the arsons, as a matter of fact, but denied ever having said anything to Jackson uh, about Cynthia Borton's murder or having any involvement in Cynthia Borton's murder. Jim agrees to have his fingerprints collected. He's also willing to undergo a polygraph. During the polygraph examination, uh, the questions I would ask were 
was he involved in the death of Cynthia Borton, specifically whether he was the one that committed the crime. Jimmy Bettis uh, insisted uh, throughout that he did not kill Cindy Borton. When I quantified uh, the polygraph examinations and I actually gave a numerical figure to each of his reactions, if they're over a minus six, that strongly in indicates to us that he's deceptive. James Bettis came up a minus 23. So there is absolutely no question he was specifically was the one involved in Cynthia Borton's murder. It was a big shock. And it really left us, and I think everyone, scratching their head. Wow. We didn't see that coming. Five months after the horrific slaying of Cindy Borden, detectives get their biggest break when her son's friend fails a polygraph. Jim Bettis's polygraph, according to Agent McCleary, showed deception on his denial that he had murdered Cindy Borton. It was very unusual that all of a sudden this person would become a suspect who was a teenager and, and also he was good friends with Cynthia's son. And he had been in Cynthia's house many occasions. Investigators confront Jim with the results. The very next thing I said was, we all know exactly what happened on September 6th. You were the one responsible for having killed Cynthia Borton. There's no question in anybody's mind now. And he came out and said, I did it. Okay, I did it. Jim Bettis had not been on our radar at all. We never dreamed that he might be capable of something like this. James Bettis told me that on September 6th of 1988, he was walking around town. He was thinking about his father. He was thinking about how he hated his father. His dad was always telling him that he was no good. He wasn't going to amount to anything. It was terrible. He hated his dad. He needed to be able to get that rage out. How he was going to do that was by seeing if he could actually kill. His statement was that he wanted to kill his father, but that he knew he couldn't get that job done, and so he killed someone who was far more vulnerable. And that Cynthia Borton was... Uh, a victim of convenience. Police believe Jim showed up at the Borton household, just narrowly missing Robert, who had gone back to work after lunch. Cynthia Borton answered the door and allowed him to come in because he had been there many times previously. During his confession, uh, Jimmy Bettis indicated that he had asked Cindy for a glass of water, which led her to walk into the kitchen. He followed her there. Uh, and approaching her from behind and grabbing a knife immediately slashed her throat from behind. He stated he had used a pocket knife of his own in addition to Cynthia Borton's kitchen utensils. And that after the crime he took his pocket knife stained with Cindy Borton's blood and threw it under a bridge. This was important information. It would corroborate uh, his confession if, in fact, that knife could be found and if, in fact, it had Cindy Borton's blood on it. Investigators scoured the area, found the knife where Jimmy Bettis described that they would find it, and when it was tested at the laboratory, indeed, it had not only Cindy Borton's blood, but also Jimmy Bettis's fingerprint. On February 2nd, 1989, detectives charge 18-year-old Jim Bettis with first-degree murder and three counts of arson. The uh, investigator told me that Jim had been arrested and he had confessed repeatedly. My first response was, no, he did not do this. He was my best friend. He was the first person that I trusted that was not an actual blood relative. It occurred to me that in at least some way I am responsible for this because I am the reason that he came into my house, that he was accepted into my house, and 
my mother is gone. There is nothing I can do to get her back. At trial, Jim is convicted, and on November 13th, 1989, he's sentenced to life in prison. Jimmy Bettis was a very troubled and angry and rage-filled young man. Had this crime not been solved when it was, uh, there's uh, every reason to be concerned that there would have been more fires, if not more murders. My best friend committed this heinous crime of murder against somebody who trusted him, supported him, and cared for him. He frequently told me that we were brothers forever, and I honestly felt the same thing for him. And then for him to turn around and do such a horrific action, there is a bit of relief knowing that he will never be out again for the rest of his life. I want as many people as possible to know and understand what a wonderful, wonderful person my mother was, which is why I share her with as many people as I possibly can. I only miss her on days that end in Y. I am still waiting for my pain to go away. I don't know that it ever will. With so much to live for. He did everything for his family. He was an amazing daddy. He loved life. He loved to to be happy. He's ruthlessly gunned down at home in front of his wife. When he was laying there on the floor, nothing can prepare you for that. They stood over the victim's body with a shotgun and delivered a fatal blow. This wasn't just a random killing. This was an assassination. Police tracked down several suspects. She was absolutely the possible person who was involved. She had all the motive. He began bragging about other involvements that he had had with acts of violence. And we knew that he and the victim had some bad blood between them. Just when police think they might never catch the killer, We were pretty frustrated, and the wind was kind of taken out of our sails. The case takes a mind-blowing turn. She sang like a songbird. He had been in possession of the guns used. Then law enforcement was pretty stunned by that. To reveal a killer no one imagined. This is unbelievable. It was someone that if you passed on the street would look as innocent as they come. The darkest, blackest soul. Known for its white sand beaches, Panama City lies on the Gulf Coast of Florida's Panhandle. Our biggest industry is uh, tourism, with uh, millions of people coming to enjoy the Gulf Coast. The community is very tight. You know most of your neighbors, you know everybody that you do business with on a personal name basis. But in the early hours of October 6, 1998, the town's sense of safety is rocked by a chilling 911 call at three o'clock in the morning there was a call from a woman that her husband had been shot and killed there was a lot of shots i ran back to the bedroom the killer wasn't in the house he was coming after us i literally thought everybody was gonna die and i was so scared police raced to the home expecting to encounter an active shooter their first thought is clearing that house, making sure that the killer's not still in the house. As the officer entered, the first thing that he noticed was the victim's body in the kitchen area. When they started calling out that they were the police and they were there, the wife was in a bedroom. She had retreated to seek safety for her and her children, which were still in the house. This is all just happening so quickly. I don't know how I'm supposed to trust that whoever's out there is not the killer. Officers find no sign of the gunman and assure Angelica it's safe to come out of the bedroom. The wife came out and she was very, very hysterical. 
when they walked me back out. When he was laying there on the floor, I knew he was gone. You have somebody murdering your husband and shooting you all in seconds. Nothing can prepare you for that. Angelica identifies the man as her husband, 30-year-old Ron Stovall. The children were taken to Ron's parents' house. They didn't live too far away. And the victim's wife went to the police department where we could talk to her. With Angelica and the children out of harm's way, detectives can examine the crime scene. As a responding detective, I go in and start looking around Ron. The victim, he had been shot three times in the back, once in the hip, and there was a shot to the back of the head. Investigators find an important clue close to the victim's body. There were some bloody footprints there on the floor. Part of those footprints had what looked like the letter H, two H's, kind of next to each other on the sole. Whoever was wearing that shoe had perpetrated at least part of the crime because they would have been standing in the victim's blood and then exiting the residence following the homicide. The Stovall's front door also reveals how the murder unfolded. We could see her husband was shot outside, and then the killer shot through the door, and he got into the house, and he had shot Ron in the back of the head. As daylight breaks, a forensic team scours the outside of the home. They found a handgun projectile out on the sidewalk near the driveway. The killer shot what it clearly looks like, a handgun round to the lower extremities, and then you have a shotgun round to the head. This was overkill. They stood over the body and delivered a fatal blow. When you see that type of crime scene, you're looking immediately for someone that displayed some type of grudge or emotional hatred for the victim. While forensics wrap up their investigation at the crime scene, detectives head to the police station to speak with Ron's wife, Angelica. We really took note how emotionally overtaken she was, but she had been an eyewitness to this scene. So she was critical in our investigation. I can't even comprehend what's going on. He was dead. I did not want to live without him. Ron was truly amazing. He was always full of life, very kind, sincere, very real. Born in Panama City, Ron Stovall was one of four siblings. He was very close with his family. He was always out doing stuff, doing stuff with school, doing stuff with the church. He was well known within the community. Ron served almost four years in the Navy. He had felt a commitment to his country and enjoyed his naval service. Ron always dreamt of having a family, and in 1989, he met his first wife, Tina Trexler. Tina and Ron got married, and they had one child, they had a daughter. The marriage was a rocky one, and after six years, it fell apart. Soon after, Ron met single mom Angelica at a local beach bar. He said he knew from the second he saw me that he loved me. Our first night, we went on a date, took me to the beach, to the ocean, put out a blanket, listened to some Marvin Gaye, had Italian food. It was very romantic. He stole my heart, and I was never in love before. I just fell right into his arms. In 1997, the couple married. Just like Ron, Angelica had a child from a previous relationship. A year later, their family of four became five when they had a daughter of their own. Ron took on several jobs. He worked as a waiter. He worked as a delivery man for the UPS companies. He was very dedicated, and he just got his massage therapy license. He did everything for his family. We were very happy. Who would want to gun down this loving husband and father in cold blood? At the station, Angelica tells police how the murder unfolded. I was able to tell the cops everything I knew, and I didn't try to hold anything back. Ron got up at about 3 o'clock every morning, and I would get up and make 
his lunch for him to take to work. She explains how Ron left the house and was suddenly ambushed. There were some shots. I didn't know what was going on. He collapsed on the ground and the killer tried coming through the door, so I was fighting with him. He got his hand through, I grabbed the gun, and he opened the door with his, with his hand, and I looked down that barrel of that silver gun, and he shot it. The bullet just misses Angelica. I ran back to the bedroom. As Angelica shares more details about the deadly attack, detectives gain important information about the killer. She described him as male, brown eyes, brown hair, and that he had some type of facial hair, possibly a mustache. She indicated hearing the assailant say to Ron as he was delivering the fatal gunshot wound, this is for her. It sounded very evil. Angelica tells police she doesn't know the meaning behind the killer's words. We need to find out who her was, and we needed to find out what made this so personal to her. Well, this wasn't just a random killing. This was an assassination, is what it was. Investigators ask Angelica who might want Ron dead. Immediately, she went to Tina, his ex-wife. Ms. Stovall indicated that the relationship between Ron and his ex-wife was volatile. There was a custody issue over their daughter. Things got a little bit more sticky with the custody setup, and Ron was filing for full custody of the child. Could the bitter custody battle have turned deadly? This was an enormous red flag for us as a team. Whoever her was may have, in fact, had to do with his ex-wife. It's probably one of the worst situations we ever deal with, is with the man and woman and children involved. It will just about make a person do anything. Coming up, police uncover a key piece of evidence. He brings out a shotgun round that is similar to the one that we've recovered from our crime scene. Leading to a disturbing plot. The photo identification that made him a prime suspect. It was his eyes. What I saw was the same person. And a sickening betrayal no one saw coming. They planned this whole thing. None of us had ever worked a case like this. I do not understand how somebody could have so much hatred. Police investigating the cold-blooded shooting of 30-year-old Ron Stovall are looking into his relationship with his ex-wife, Tina Trexler. We knew that there was an extreme amount of tension between Ron and his ex-wife, and there was a custody battle that was forthcoming. Ron and Tina originally shared custody, but Ron had filed a petition basically saying that he wanted full custody of the child. Up to this point, Tina was that individual that had the most to gain from Ron's death. Perhaps she had not been the one on scene, but it still doesn't eliminate her as having some type of involvement. This looked like certainly a an intentional and a premeditated killing. Might have been a killing for hire. Detectives speak to Ron's friends and family to get a clearer picture of the animosity with Tina. When Ron remarried, it was okay, but not really okay. Tina, as well as her family, did not like the new wife and the situation deteriorated between all of them. As Ron and Angelica's family grew, Tina's behavior appeared increasingly erratic. Tina began feeling that Ron was trying to work Tina out of the picture as the mother, and so that had really kind of amplified the rub and the tension. There was all this, you know, crazy fighting, and it was too hard for his daughter. We were just concerned. This custody hearing was coming up in about two or three weeks from when this incident happened. Tina was absolutely the possible person who was involved in this murder. She had all the motive. Could the custody battle have driven Ron's ex-wife to murder? Investigators bring Tina in for an interview. One of the things that was most alarming when we sat down with Tina was that there was no remorse, no emotional activity on her part that she was even concerned that he was dead. When investigators ask about her relationship with Ron, 
Tina's answer is surprising. We knew there were a lot of hostilities, but when Tina was interviewed, she kind of painted that the relationship with them was cordial, it was friendly. It's a red flag for us as investigators because she's already showing signs of deceit. With suspicions raised, detectives grilled Tina about her whereabouts in the hours leading up to Ron's murder. She told us the night before the homicide, she had went to work at a local restaurant. She was a bartender. She got off sometime between 11 and midnight. She had went home and sat and watched TV with her mother. Then after that, that she had went to bed, and at the time of the homicide itself, she had been home asleep. Before police can press Tina further, the interview is interrupted. Her mother had hired a lawyer for her. The attorney made contact with Tina and immediately ended the interview. Unable to finish questioning Tina, detectives look into her alibi. Police were able to establish that she had been at work that night till 11.30, 12 o'clock. Investigators also speak with Tina's mother, Ann Trexler. She was the grandmotherly type and was helping Tina get back on her feet and help her get through this divorce. And come across as a very down-to-earth, nice lady, a housewife. And she confirmed that Tina had been at the house with her watching TV. Though Tina's alibi checks out, police still theorize that she could have hired someone to kill her ex-husband. We conducted a preliminary investigation into her financial records. Everything was consistent with that of just a working-class individual making normal purchases. One week into the investigation with no concrete evidence pointing at Tina, police look for other suspects. They quickly discover Tina wasn't the only one in a dispute with Ron. Tina had a boyfriend. His name was Adrian Harris. And there had been some confrontations between Ron and Mr. Harris regarding the way Ron was treating Tina. And in fact, at one point, there had been some threats made on Harris's part. Had Adrian decided to confront Ron, leading to deadly consequences? As we begin looking into Mr. Harris, whether he was paid to do it or whether he did it on his own, we weren't sure. But the concern was that he may have perpetrated this to make good with Tina for the purpose of helping her. Investigators tracked down Adrian over 900 miles away near Baltimore. When we talked with Adrian, he did acknowledge that there was some bad blood between the two of them, but he really kind of downplayed the significance. The day of the murder, he told us he went to work. He had clocked in before 7.30, and the time of Ron's death was 3.30 in the morning. Detectives checked travel times between Baltimore and Panama City. There was not enough time to get to Panama City from several states away to do the murder and go back home. While Adrian is ruled out, someone close by catches the investigator's attention. We talked to his roommate, Guy McInvale. When the officers went to talk to Adrian's uh, roommate, they discovered the description of the killer that Angelica gave to the law enforcement. The roommate fitted quite well. Guy McInvale it had brown eyes, brown hair, and he had a mustache. Now we had another individual that we want to look at. Once we saw Guy fit the description, he was a roommate with Adrian Harris, and we knew that Harris and the victim had some bad blood between them. We thought maybe he went there to kill him. Is this the break police have been hoping for? Investigators rush to confirm if Guy is a true match for the gunman. We got pictures of him to show the victim's wife, Angelica. See if he could have been the one that she saw that night. Back in Panama City, detectives include the picture of Guy into a photo lineup. Angelica was an essential witness. She was a witness who could identify the individual that did the crime. Her photographic identification, it was surprising. It has been two weeks since 30-year-old father, Ron Stovall, was shot to death at home in front of his wife, Angelica. Now, detectives hope she can identify the shooter from a photo lineup. She picked out Guy McInvale as being the killer. It was his eyes 
there was something very, very similar. What I saw was the same person. There was an identification of Guy McInvale that made him a prime suspect. We have Miss Stovall's positive identification of Guy as the individual that was in front of their house. There's a sense of relief that begins to sweep through the unit because you're finally on to a really developing hot lead. We want to now try to establish what type of physical evidence do we actually have between the victim, Ron, and Guy. Detectives get a search warrant and race over to Guy's Baltimore residence. They make a telling discovery. We search his items and looking at me right square in the face was a pair of shoes consistent with the shoe impression that we had at the scene. So we're moving in the right direction. Police bring Guy to the local police station for questioning. Although we still were missing the key pieces of evidence, the guns and, and such as that, we really felt like we're starting to put together the edges of the puzzle. In speaking with Guy, what he provided us for an alibi was that he was in Maryland working at the end of work. He went home, slept. The next day he got up, went to work. And so, so that was his alibi. Detectives check out Guy's story. We had had an opportunity to speak with Guy at his place of employment, and we were able to collect some video that, that correlated with his timeline of what he said. There was physically no way possible for him to have been here in Panama City at the time of the, the crime. It turned out that what Guy McInville said to the police was correct. Guy had an alibi. Eager to further prove his innocence, Guy volunteers to take a polygraph. He successfully passed that. So we were able to clear Mr. McInville. For police, it's a disappointing setback. We were pretty frustrated, and it's a roller coaster. It's one of those, now you're back in the lows again, and the wind was kind of taken out of our sails. Angelica wanted to help the officers along, but her perception at the time of the event was clouded by the terror, the trauma of the incident itself. I remember him being the same person. It stuck in my head like that, but I was wrong. It's difficult when you see something that quick that you can say, okay, this is the individual that did the crime. We thought we had this thing solved, but you just got to go regroup, see what you still have to do, and you just start from there. Desperate for new leads, investigators review Ron's autopsy report. The autopsy confirmed two different weapons. They told us that it was a 357 round that he had been shot with, plus the shotgun shell. One big thing we learned was that shotgun residue got in his face. We think that Ron was laying there on the floor, and this guy's saying this is for her, and he presses that shotgun to the back of his head, and Ron's looking at him when that went off. The forensics report contains another crucial detail that could lead police to the killer. These were close proximity rounds, and so we knew that this was something personal. And the shotgun shell was paramount. It was a unique round. We would be able to identify it. So that was a plus in our corner. Detectives shared details of the firearms with local law enforcement, hoping to track down their owner. We work so closely with the different police departments in the area. We talk to them all the time in case something turns up. As investigators continue to search for answers, Ron's loved ones struggle with their grief. The best thing in my life was that life. I didn't think I was strong enough to go through anything without him. He was always full of life. Losing your soulmate, you can't even explain how much pain that was. It still is. It'll never go away. Three weeks after Ron's murder, the investigation is threatening to grow cold, but then police receive a tip that reignites the case. We got a call from the Panama City Beach Police Department. They had a home invasion out there on the beach. During that arrest, they recovered two handguns and a short-barreled shotgun. 
They knew from the investigation of the crime scene where Ron Stovall was killed that a shotgun had been used and that a handgun had been used. That coincides with what we're looking for. We wanted to go over the evidence they had and the circumstances. Could these be the weapons connected to Ron's murder? The gentleman that they arrested, we started looking into him and looking at his background and everything. And he had a pretty lengthy criminal history, had actually been uh, linked to some murders in the past. He really caught our attention. This turned out to be a big break. Police in Panama City are investigating the cold-blooded homicide of husband and father, Ron Stovall. They now believe the missing murder weapons were used in a home invasion robbery less than 15 miles away. When meeting with this investigator from the Beach Police Department, what he produced from his crime scene was this, a handgun and a sawed-off shotgun. That coincides with what we're looking for. Then he brings out a shotgun round that is similar to the one that we've recovered from our crime scene. We have everything that meets the parameters. Now we, we really believe we, we're on the right path. The weapons are sent off to the crime lab. While detectives await the results, they dig deeper into this new lead. At the Beach Police Department, they identified the individual as Tony Alberto Perez. He went by Tony. He had an extensive criminal history. There was some acts of violence in his past or some drugs in his past. They really felt like he was a pretty violent individual. Another detail catches their attention. Tony had brown eyes, brown hair, and facial hair. He looks just like our guy. He met Miss Stovall's physical description to a T. Investigators head to the nearby jail where Tony is being held for the home invasion. He come across as a kind of a likable guy. He was laughing and cutting up. But the more he talked, the more red flags went up. He began bragging about other involvements that he had had with acts of violence. He was completely nonchalant about it. Detectives turn up the heat and ask Tony if he killed Ron Stovall. Tony totally denied any involvement, any knowledge of Ron, any knowledge of anything that may have happened on that date, and basically told law enforcement, it's not me, I'm not the person. Despite Tony's denials, investigators believe he's withholding information, and they obtain a search warrant. Tony Perez had items that he owned stored at the landlord's house, and we're searching through Tony Perez's items over there. And then we find a pair of work boot type shoes. While inspecting the footwear, detectives notice a key detail. Those work boots had what looked like the letter H, two H's kind of next to each other on the sole. It looked like what we had found at the crime scene. And we got those sent right off to the lab. As police hunt for more incriminating evidence against Tony, the ballistic results come back. And we actually got confirmation from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement that the, the guns collected that Tony had been in possession of matched perfectly ballistically to the rounds that we had recovered from our scene. That evidence right there is one of the biggest things you could have in any murder case. You can find the weapons and find a person who has the weapons. That's major. So now that we can put Tony, at least the guns, at the scene, that gave us the ability to change gears with Tony. We had the information and ammunition that we needed to confront Tony about what really happened. Detectives head back to the jail to interview their prime suspect. As Tony began to kind of spin his version of what happened to Ron, now he acknowledged having a little knowledge of it, but he said that he had loaned his guns to someone else and that he didn't know what they did with him. He didn't have any involvement in it. But what he says is that he had heard Ron was dealing drugs, and that's why he was killed. We had already done a thorough background on Ron. We knew Ron was not involved in any drug business. We had talked to too many people. He was a happily married man trying to make it in life. That's what Ron was. Then Tony gave us information that would kind of put us on some individuals that might be involved. And we tracked those individuals down and we were able to confirm 100% that they had nothing to do with Ron's death. 
People sometimes when they are being questioned, especially when the police have some of the goods on them, will make up stories. And that's what Perez did. As far as the police could determine, that was a total concoction by Tony Perez. Detectives believe Tony is lying, but wonder what motive he could have to kill Ron. We were still kind of struggling to establish how Tony would have came into Ron's life. Going through Tony's belongings, we found some cell phone bills there, and they were linked to the name of Kim Miller. Kim Miller turned out to be Tony's girlfriend. So we went to talk to Kim. Kim Miller is the owner of a Panama City hair salon. Tony and Kimberly, they had been in a romantic relationship for several months. We were told by Kim that Tony, he was doing odd things for her. He would come around the hair salon and he would actually shampoo customers' hair, clean up, sweep up the shop, things like that. Investigators look for a connection between Tony and Ron Stovall. Kim was familiar with the the Stovall homicide. She claims that she first heard about it because she had a customer that had called in and canceled her hair appointment saying how her ex-son-in-law had been murdered. When detectives ask Kim for the customer's name, they receive a startling response. The connection kind of came out of nowhere and almost as a surprise. Kim's clients is Ann Trexler, who happens to be Tina's mother, Tina, Ron's ex-wife. Police believe husband and father Ron Stovall was shot and killed by criminal Tony Perez. They're now exploring a potential link between Tony and Ron's ex-wife, Tina Trexler. When Kim Miller indicated that she styled Tina's mother, Van Trexler's hair, then law enforcement was pretty stunned by that. Ann Trexler is the mother of Ron's ex-wife, Tina. We knew of the ongoing hostilities between Ron and Tina. So when we talked with Kim Miller, we asked her if she had ever met Tina, his ex-wife, and she did met her on a couple of occasions. Tina's mother, Ann, however, was a regular client, was in there on a regular basis. With Tina previously eliminated from the investigation, detectives asked Kim more about Tina's mother, 52-year-old Ann Trexler. She told us that Ann's talking to her and telling her about these problems with her daughter going through this custody battle with her ex-husband. And she was upset about it. She's afraid she's going to lose her grandchild. Ann had told Kimberly the Trexlers had to get a second mortgage on their home to provide legal assistance to Tina. Could the custody battle be the motive behind Ron's murder? At that point, we were trying to determine exactly who she was. She hadn't really been on our radar at all. We knew that she was Tina's mom. We knew that she was Tina's alibi at the time of this crime. And Trexler, no criminal history, supposedly a wonderful grandmother and fine Christian lady who would never be involved in something like this. Investigators contact Ron's wife, Angelica and learn his custody dispute with Tina brought out a different side to his former mother-in-law. Apparently they had a good relationship when Tina and and them were married, but it was just a a constant, constant battle over visitation rights. Always just such a fight with her. Looking to see if Anne could have anything to do with Ron's murder, detectives bring her in for an interview. When we talked to her, She stated to us that there was no way that she had anything to do with killing. She did not want him dead. Matter of fact, she said she loved him. And then Ann Trexler wanted a lawyer. And once once they get a lawyer, you're done talking. So we're kind of getting a heightened sense of concern as far as her involvement in the case because she decided to basically not cooperate with the investigation. Having hit a wall with Ann, detectives get a breakthrough when forensics results arrive. We got confirmation that Tony's boot was consistent with the shoe impression that we had at the scene. Also, Tony had been in possession of the guns used. Now you've got a personal item putting him at the crime scene. At that point, we knew we had our shooter. That's a big piece of evidence right there. We were able to go back to Tony and present him with what we knew. He admitted 
killing Ron. His very words were, okay, I did it. It's the shortest confession to a murder I've ever taken in my career. Investigators push Tony to reveal how the crime unfolded, and what he tells them is shocking. Tony told us that Ann Trexler wanted to have her ex-son-in-law killed and was willing to pay to have it done. When we found out Ann Trexler wanted to hire somebody to kill Ron, I mean, this, this just, this is unbelievable. Ex-mother-in-law? Gonna get involved and have, have pay somebody to kill her ex-son-in-law? He had met Ann at the hair salon. She was complaining about Ron and that the two of them had worked out a deal for Tony to kill Ron in exchange for about $10,000 to be paid to Tony. On November 10, 1998, Tony is charged with the first-degree murder of Ron Stovall. But the case is far from over. Detectives turn their attention back to alleged mastermind Ann Drexler. Searching for answers, detectives pull Ann's phone records. The phone records were a treasure trove of information. They showed a lot of phone traffic between Kim Miller and Antonio Perez and Ann Trexler. It clearly looks like Kimberly was the middle person between Ann and Tony. There were phone calls between the Trexler house and Kim Miller at strange hours of the night for strange amounts of time that could not be explained away by saying, we're setting up our rents and set. Another thing, we were able to show that Ann Trexler received a phone call from Kim Miller the morning right after Ron's death. So there were links to tie Ann Trexler to this plot, but there was no hard concrete connection of evidentiary value. We needed something else that would show that Ann, in fact, had hired Antonio Perez to kill Ron Stovall. Tony Perez, he says that he had come to an agreement with Ann Trexler, killed Ron for $10,000. Detectives scour Ann's financial records for any signs she had commissioned Ron's murder. We have withdrawals from her bank accounts that coincide with when Tony says he was paid and the amount that he was paid. So now we have proof that what Tony's telling us is accurate regarding being paid. With regards to Ann, none of us had ever worked a case like this. So it was kind of a shock that all of these pieces were kind of lining up to support she is the motivation to this entire crime. But we felt like we still could not make the case against Ann Trexler. We needed someone to corroborate what Tony Perez said. We needed somebody else that can draw the line between the money and the murder of Ron Stovall. We have to go back to the middleman in, in the case, which is Kim Miller. She's the whole key to this thing. She was looking at criminal charges, but without her, we're not going to get Ann. She is the only way that we're going to have true accounts of what happened. We went and picked up Kim Miller and brought her in. Kim Miller, she stonewalled. She said no. I'm not talking to you. I'm not telling you anything. Investigators working the Ron Stovall homicide have charged shooter Tony Perez with murder and believe the mastermind is Ron's former mother-in-law, Ann Trexler. But to build an ironclad case, they need Tony's girlfriend and go-between Kim Miller to share what she knows. However, Kim is refusing to talk. It really wasn't until we actually laid out in front of her the phone records and drew the lines between Ann and her and her and Tony that we were able to convince her to cooperate with the investigation. We let her know, you know, she was going to be charged with accessory to the murder and she's facing life in prison. Prosecutors offer Kim a deal a reduced sentence in exchange for testifying against Ann Trexler. Eventually, Kim takes the deal. Kim sang like a songbird. Kimberly was very adamant that there was a deep-seated hatred for Ron on Ann Trexler's part. 
She indicated that on many occasions, Van Trexler ranted and raved about Ron Stovall, how bad he was, that he was going to remove her granddaughter. She wished that somebody would take him out, and it got more and more. Finally, Kim said, okay, if you're really serious, I know somebody who might help you. Kim lets her know that her boyfriend, Tony Perez, will get rid of him for $10,000. That's how the deal came about. Kim then reveals how in the early hours of October 6th, Tony drove to the Stovall house to lie in wait for Ron. About 3 o'clock in the morning, when Ron went out to his vehicle, Tony took a shot at him with a pistol. And Ron ran inside and slammed the door behind him, and Tony Perez fired more shots, which struck Ron in the back. To finish Ron off, Tony tried to force his way inside the house. Angelica, she tried to hold the door, and Tony Perez fired a shot that almost struck her. She ran to the other room to call 911. Tony Perez came in, and he found Ron on the floor and walked up with a shotgun, said, this is for her. Boom. He killed Ron Stovall right there. When he made the statement, this is for her, it's our belief that Tony was doing this on Ann's behalf. Tony came there to do one thing, and that was to kill Ron Stovall. Once he had made his getaway, he was able to reach out to Kimberly and make notice to her that, in fact, the job had been done. And then, of course, she notified Ann. Kim swears Ron's ex-wife, Tina Trexler, wasn't involved in their murderous plan. Law enforcement looked at Tina Trexler. Her mother, Ann, may have confided in her, but no one could get to that much evidence to put Tina in the situation of taking Ron's life. Ann Trexler, she tried to be the, you know, the grandmotherly type, but she planned this whole thing. Ann Trexler's thought pattern was Ron Stovall is getting ready to take my only precious granddaughter away from me, and I won't have visitation, and he left my daughter, he married somebody else, he, he should not be able to get away with this. From an investigator's perspective, Ann carried just as much weight as Tony. Without Ann, Tony would not have even known who Ron Stovall was. On February 15, 2000, Ann Trexler is formally charged with the murder of her former son-in-law, Ron Stovall. And the cops called and he said, got her, she's in jail. She is morbidly evil the darkest, blackest soul ever. And then she'll put on a face like she's just Miss Innocent. The killer, he didn't know Ron and knew Ron. I do not understand how somebody can have so much hatred in their body, in their mind, in their heart. In court, Shooter Tony Perez pleads guilty and is sentenced to life without parole. In February 2000, Kim Miller is sentenced to five years probation as part of her deal with prosecutors. Finally, in 2001, Ann's trial begins and she pleads not guilty. Ann Trexler took the stand. She testified about not being involved. She testified about her concerns uh, of her grandchild and the fact that she had absolutely no involvement. On May 14, 2001, the jury finds Ann Trexler guilty of first-degree murder. She's sentenced to life in prison without parole. There's a little peace. I'm in a little peace in this horrible thing. A little justice, I guess. It gets a little emotional sometimes. It's not just me. You know, we, we're a whole team working this thing. It, we celebrated, I'll just say that. We celebrated this. The most striking thing to me is that these are all ordinary people. And it's a little bit frightening to think that people who are walking around living everyday ordinary lives would be capable of this. The one that initiated it all was someone that if you passed on the street, would look as innocent as they come. For Ron's family, his loss continues to be deeply felt. I miss him and I love him so much. My poor daughter, she never got to honor 
that she deserved. She never got her daddy. We celebrate his life all the time. He loved life. He loved to, to be happy. And I tried so hard to keep his memory alive. Very much so. I will never forget how amazing Ron was.